Good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, June 8th, 2022, and this is a meeting of the Gloucester School Committee. Uh, we are meeting at Gloucester High School at 32 Leslie O. Johnson Road. Um, consistent with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted by remote participation. The public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and listen to the meeting in real time and participate when necessary. If you are calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you are watching on a computer or device, there's a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during all the communications to recognize to speak. Um, I will state that the mission of Gloucester Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. And I ask that you stand. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The mayor will likely not be with us when we had a conflict. <coughs> and Melissa Tixar Prince is joining us on the screen. Oh. Um, Okay, comments from the chair. Um, I just want to announce that the Gloucester High School class of 2022 has their graduation this Sunday. The forecast looks great. Um, How did you know I just checked it moments ago? <laughs> excellent, and it's at 1.30 in the afternoon at, um, on the field. And so if the public wants to come and cheer on and celebrate all the accomplishments of these students, um, they are welcome to come. That's a, a good time. Um, we will move on to recognitions. And I'll just continue just to say that the seniors had their prom last Friday night. It was my first promenade, um, which I don't know why I never went, but now that I had somebody in it, it was just a magical event, I think, for the kids and for the, the people that attend. Um, I understand why people go year after year, whether that student doing it or not, because you uh, get to see everybody all dressed up and you know, what the girls are wearing. And, just a lot of fun, a lot of fun, good activities for the end of year. Anything to add? Mr. Um, no, I just, yeah, echo, echo that. It was a great night. We went uh, to uh, Georgetown to uh, Black Swan for, for the evening after doing the promenade here in the field house. Uh, we had some new folks running things for the promenade and, and uh, just kept up uh, the high standards that we've had in the past, but it was really well attended. You know, it was really great to see so many people in there, um, uh, I was, uh, Superintendent Lomas was particularly excited. Uh, he said <laughs> afterwards, by similar to you about attending um, the spectacle of it all. Um, other people, there were at least half a dozen other people for whom it was their first time as well, and they thought it was spectacular. Right, all the some pretty crazy outfits, really uh, high, you know, um, creative uh, stuff from the kids, and then we had a great night. Georgetown as well. A great and safe night. We started a new tradition this year where when um, thanks to um, a, a donor at Rockport Mortgage, we had ice cream for the high school students when they got back here. So Officer Stola, our SRO, distributed ice cream to kids as they got off the limos and buses and so on. So it was like little kids out there after their prom night eating ice cream right out here out front. It was really a great way to end the evening. I think I said, Mr. Cook, there, we should do it every week. You, you did say that. You <laughs> <say, laughs> did say that. That would be a little much, but yes. Anybody else have any other recognition? Uh, yeah, two things. One is just on the prom. I, I, after the prom, I looked at all the pictures on Facebook and I said, you know, obviously the young ladies look wonderful and all that. But I said, the real difference is the guys. The, the guys just look really sharp. Now. These kids know how to dress, they have style. I think the prompts I went to, I went to the tux from Mr. Tux, you know, <laughs> ruffles and a cummerbund of some sort look terrible compared to these kids with the European cut suits and looking great. So it's a long way from what you <laughs> want to wear. I think all so good for them. Good on the boys. I know it's all, you know, the girls, Chris, Chris Gibbs on that, but the boys I thought looked outstanding. So um, but the other uh, acknowledgement for me was the elementary school band. Uh, just to see that is phenomenal. People, young kids interested in music and uh, the people behind that, the music educators and the 
believe the GEF has helped with that. So um, certainly worth seeing, and it's really, really great to see. So. I'd just like to second that on the elementary band. Uh, Jamie Klopotowski is the elementary band director uh, with the support of a $65,000 grant from the Gloucester Ed Foundation to um, um, provide um, the instruction in the afternoon. The program has been, you know, had a tough time the last couple of years, and it was a real, very important to rebuild. Uh, the number of students coming into the middle school so that the uh, Monday night uh, elementary band, band concert, I think there, there are 40 kids from all five elementary schools in fourth grade and 40 in fifth grade. The energy was incredible. They, they really did a great job. And then uh, Tuesday, uh, last night, a number of us, superintendent was there, Lynn was there for the eighth grade stage band. Um, and the all grades, uh, all grades on the stage band. Oh, sorry, the uh, the eighth grade lab, uh, which was uh, a group of students who maybe hadn't uh, done a, uh, used, um, learned an instrument before or had taken a break, but really needed uh, a lot of work. They were incredible. The vocals were terrific. Uh, it was just it was a lot of fun. And then the stage band was was afterward, and I think there are over eighty students involved. Um, All together, I think we're about there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think over 80 students, and there might have been, you know, near that all packed onto that stage. And Sunday um, night we had the jazz band. Too, yeah. So they had to split it because there were so many kids involved. Yeah. So, you know, three days worth of uh, really great music. And I have to say, Carlos Menezes, and I don't have the program in front of me because there's a long list of instructors and supporters and people who uh, were, were there. Uh, you know, for, uh, photographing and uh, sound mixing. It's just there were so many people who came together uh, to make that. But the best thing about it all was the incredible energy. I mean, they were just whooping and hollering and so happy to be in person. And the music was fantastic. It was really good. Um, I have a couple more. I wanted to. Um, Give a shout out to Don Enos. If anybody is connected with Gloucester Sports at all, you know Don Enos, who takes pictures of almost every sport. Um, she, I believe, does all of the um, individual players and their team pictures. Um, she helps create the banners for senior night. She is just everywhere, and Absolutely. this is all volunteer. And the, the quality of her photos, I mean, if you ever tried to catch your kid, in any action shot, it's nearly impossible, but she gets phenomenal photos and then she'll post them all on Facebook. Um, so, you know, if, depending upon the team, she's done JB, she's done varsity, um, as I say, she does practically every sport and uh, all because she loves it. Um, so I just wanted to give her a shout out because she really is uh, quite an asset to our schools in a volunteer way. Um, and the other one I want to mention is, um, winners of the Poetry Without Paper um, contest. They had many people submit from um, Gloucester Middle School, um, O'Malley Innovation Middle School, um, and the high school. So the awards uh, for first place um, went to Olivia Hogan Lopez from Gloucester High School, 12th grade. Um, O'Malley Innovation Middle School winners are um, First place was Emma Wilt, an eighth grader. Um, Esme Saruf, also an eighth grader. Um, Alina Brown, a seventh grader. Uh, and then we have some elementary. Um, we have Bianca Numerosi, who was a fourth grader at Punk Hope, and Jack Fritzen, who was a second grader at West Parish. Um, so it's nice that the community has these kids you know, challenge themselves and submit, submit their work. So tomorrow evening at, um, at the Sawyer Library, the uh, award winners and, and those who are all going to honorable mention are being recognized at the Sawyer Free at 6 o'clock tomorrow. So tomorrow's a, a busy night on a lot of levels. Plum Cove is also having their uh, Annie Kids performance. Um, and, a couple of, and Beeman is having their uh, learning demonstration night too. Pose you that paper poetry at Sawyer Free Lots.
Okay, so um, oh, I did recognitions before all communications. My apologies if there's anybody attending who would like to speak under oral communications. Uh, you will have up to three minutes and you must state your name and address for the record. Um, and um, school committee chair will not allow it, um, not allow claims as to individual performance or character. I think I covered the gist of, of the, um, the rules on oral communication. So if there's anybody who is in attendance who would like to speak, now is your opportunity. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move on to the consent agenda. Anybody have any items they would like to remove? Okay, we have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Okay, Maria, may we have the roll call vote? Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Weeson? Yes. Chairperson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minio? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes. Okay. Motion passes six to zero. Uh, we will move on to deliberations on educational issues. Um, first, we have an update on the CBTE program at Gloucester High School. Let's go. Thank you. Like for today? If you could, yes. Okay. Sorry. No, no. Sure. Words are just about to come out of my mouth. Okay. <laughs> you could do. You want to start? Sure. Yeah, I'll start, start, start talking about it. So um, it, it was really uh, interesting in, in preparing this report to look back. Uh, this uh, last year when I gave this report now different things were the emphasis last year um, was on uh, how we emerge out of uh, COVID year. Um, what are the, the um, variations that we had to do over the course of the 2020-2021 year um, you know, in order to keep programs going um, in, in that hybrid form, and then what we were looking ahead to do. And it was really great to look back on having done so many of the things that we said we would do last year. So, so that will be the, the, the focus of, of today. I will um, so talk about each shop as well as the uh, vocational program overall. And I will uh, say a few things about um, bringing on a uh, director of CBTE beginning July 1st, which is really uh, what we've been working on throughout this year um, that we'd set up last year. So um, for folks who are you know new to uh, these presentations, uh, we have, we currently have four chapter 74 CBTE programs. Um, these are, um, so we have other courses that we offer that are vocational in nature, but they're not uh, fully um, developed uh, chapter 74 programs. Our four programs are advanced manufacturing, also called machine technology, automotive technology, carpentry technology, and electricity technology. I'll talk about each one in the presentation. So these are some highlights, some, some things that have happened this year back in the fall. We had our NEASC accreditation visit, as, as you folks know, and our CBT programs were a key aspect of that visit um, because those programs exemplify our vision of the graduate, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a more in, in a real clear way that is easy to show folks. Our CBT programs involve problem solving, communication, and collaboration every day for our students. So it was uh, one of the places that we showcased in our um, successful NEASC accreditation visit. Um, in the fall, uh, we also had our annual Perkins grant approved. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how we used that this year. Um, we, as you know, uh, we were uh, tasked this year with revising our admissions policy to be inclusive. Um, and that's something that DESE are required of all CBT programs. Uh, we continued with an open house here at the high school and course selection meetings that featured our CBTE programs. In April, we found out that we, for the second time, we got a three-year uh, grant from Lion Wah um, through GEF, uh, another um, $150,000 for the auto program. In the spring uh, of 2022, we also uh, were able to hire a CBTE director, Brenda Waslick, who will begin July 1st, um, and that's through grant funding as well, through an anonymous donor that we worked uh, uh, Connected, got connected with through GEF as well. And um, in spring 2022, um, the admission policy was approved and now and we've used it. We've, uh, we've used the, the policy um, 
and I'll say a little bit more about that as, as later slides. So that's a kind of an overview of the year. All right. Um, so I can jump. Here. There. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So um, focusing on advanced manufacturing for a moment. Um, our sustainable improvements and innovations there. Um, this year was our year implementing the new computer lab and classroom. So we used uh, Perkins funds last year to uh, modernize our computer lab and um, advanced manufacturing classroom. Um, one of the real practical things is students now have two monitors that allow them, they use one monitor to um, watch or read um, uh, directions, the learning of something that they're then applying in the other screen. So they're um, using um, the uh, software for design while also being able to go back and consult the directions. It's a really cool you know, process where you know, it's the teacher is asked a question and the teacher can direct the student to sort of look that up on their own, um, which you know, adds that layer that we want of independence for high school students. So just asking the teacher and getting an answer how to fix something, they're directed to where they can fix it while not closing out that window. And you know, they're then able to keep continuing to work with uh, SolidWorks. Really interesting things uh, in my observations in the class. Also by updating the computers in there, um, the, the SolidWorks is just a lot easier to use and interface with the machines um, on the floor of the lab, right? So they're, they're saving things for the flash drive and bringing it out to the, uh, the milling equipment. Um, and, and the other equipment on the floor of the advanced manufacturing to actually create things. Uh, this summer, we'll be continuing our advanced manufacturing expansion uh, program, um, you know, per the general GE grant, uh, foundation grant that we have um, for KPAN, um, recent graduates and other adults to get training in advanced manufacturing. So we'll keep that shot rolling even through the summertime. In the next slide, you can see what the double monitor setup looks like. And you can see um, you know, the, the wonderful lighthouses that the, the kids make every year. Um, that is the sort of right monitor, right? Has the you know, information about uh, the how-to. They're designing uh, with SolidWorks in the left monitor and then on the floor, they're producing uh, products such as the one you see on the right there. The next slide, we move on to uh, AutoTech. Again, we had that um, second three-year uh, gift from Lion Wong. And this funding supports a second auto teacher, which means we can accept 30 students every fall instead of just 15 students. So that's a, requ a state requirement, 15 per teacher. Um, we're able to have 30 students, and we have accepted 30 students the year coming. You'll see that later as well. Um, it also means, and something I've observed, is that the, the instruction at all levels, from the ones all the way up to the level four students, can be more differentiated. Um, so Mr. Machel is working with this student on breaks while these students are uh, preparing to dismantle an engine related to the same project over here. Um, and then they can rotate the students, right? So you have three or four kids, six kids um, that get uh, are listening and then doing, listening and then doing, or watching and then doing. Um, and, and they get many more, you know, reps or, or many more opportunities to, to, to take, uh, to participate than they would if we just had a single teacher in that, in that class. And that's something that I've been able to observe directly. It's been really great to see this year. Um, the the Lionwa grant also has supported some of the tools and materials you'll see a little bit later. This year with our Perkins grant funds that I mentioned earlier, uh, we uh, purchased diagnostic scanners. So in, in, in your average car, 85% of what's there is diagnosed with a scanner. It's computer diagnosed with a scanner. And students, you know, to be industry ready to work, they need to know how to read those. Um, the particular kind of scanners, I was told down in the shop today, there's only one um, shop on Cape Ann other than our auto shop that has the same uh, level of tech um, with the, the scanners we're because they're brand new right? you're able to get the same one professional shop has yeah the exactly that's right yep yeah. um, so these are great to see in action as well seeing students diagnosing and, and then right with this um, the diagnostic scanners and then um, actually applying that to um, fixing problems that arise 
Also, when you have an expansion of a program, when you add students, you need basic tools. You know, you need the wrenches, you need the ratchets, you need all that stuff. So we use Perkins grant uh, funding this year to also help us expand the program. And you'll see that in the, the picture slides that come up next. All right, you'll see uh, some of our students, Sam, Ryan, and Austin are showing off the tools that, that um, we were able to add to, to expand um, our pro help expand our program. They were happy to show, show it off. Show them off. Uh, they're in the uh, auto three and four program. In the next slide, you'll get to see uh, the scanning, um, how, the, how the scanners come. So they are portable around the, the shop. On the right, you have, that is uh, another thing we purchased this year, which is a rotisserie, right? <laughs> right? You can flip the car upside down or back up to work on it in different ways. So you can see doing some, uh, some work there. With the rotisserie, it was fun to see that in action. So that's some of what we've been able to upgrade this year. And then just like in the machine, we're implementing um, past purchases. So the students, the thing they were really excited to talk to me about was the tire changer and the road force uh, tire balance. Um, it's something they're able to use on a regular basis this year that we purchased last year. Now it's fully implemented into the curriculum for this year. So that's auto tech. Um, in the next uh, slide, you'll get to get a, a glimpse at our, our carpentry tech program. In carpentry tech, the the kind of the way that we're approaching carpentry is through skill building, how parts relate to the whole, and on meeting needs. So you can see um, I could show windows, in the, but I'm, you know, here I'm showing the, the uh, staircase. I'm showing some um, other work, cabinetry work that the students are doing. I'm working on um, uh, uh, different uh, roofs. Um, they're working on other aspects, the parts that go into the hole. And with each one, they're building different kinds of skills um, that go into that, you know, whatever that part is over the course of the year. And they're building them from the carpentry program level four. But they're not only doing that, they're also responding to some of the needs in our in our school and in our community. So you can see a um, picture there from our, I could have chosen, there are five different projects over the course of the year in our nurse's office that the, the students in the carpentry program helped them with. There you can see some shelving they built in um, to make better use of the space. They, they built other shelving as well, some other things for our nurse. Um, and also from our carpentry program, the beautiful new arch at the uh, promenade was also oh. recently built by our carpentry program. So that's you know a little bit about skill building, the parts that go into the whole, and then meeting some needs that the community has using their skills to do that. Really exciting in electricity. Uh, today was the, the day that I actually, I got to go around with um, Bob Devlin and take a look at where we are with the solar power canopy project with a projected completion next spring. This is one of the things I talked about last year as something we get started on this year. Um, up to this point, um, the students are, what you're seeing here is the ceiling of the, the auto shop where uh, these, um, the, what you're seeing here is the, the uh, conduits for um, wiring. And the, the exciting thing here that, that, that Bob was talking about is how the students learned to bend, right? You see the bends, uh, I don't know how well you can see the picture there, but here and here, um, they're having to bend the pipes around what's existing in there. And that's all um, skills that the students developed um, and he was really impressed with. Uh, he was really worried that they'd be able to pull this off and they did a really good job. And it looks elegant in there. It's really, you wouldn't know that it was something that students just created and put up. Um, so they're putting in some of the infrastructure that next year um, they'll be able to continue with, with the project. The next slide gives you a glimpse of where it will be. So if you look between, essentially between the white um, vertical stripes there to the left and to the right of the, the auto entrance, um, the carpentry shop will be building canopies that will have the solar panels on them. And um, another part of the project will be rewiring the auto shop to the right. If you look to the right of that opening, um, part of the project will also rewire um, that area. And again, 
it's a collaboration of all of, of our all our shops. Uh, 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 machine tech are, are doing some of the pieces. Um, they said carpentry, building canopies. Uh, auto is, is hosting um, and using the electricity and um, some labor that they put into it as well. And then uh, you know the main bulk of the project is our electrical students learning um, solar. Um, installation. So, so where, where, where do the canopies go? They are attached. To yeah, the they'll be attached off here. Yeah, uh, exactly. And so there's a all uh, collaboration with the provider and uh, with engineers to make sure that it's uh, secure. That was one of the things Bob was my uh, Mr. Devlin and I were talking about today. Um, so that's a really exciting project that will you know benefit our, our school and it'll look really cool uh, when it's when it's ready. Um, the other part of that is other folks uh, doing these canopies is, is unusual and presents unusual problems. Most of the installation is roof based, right? Um, and so our students will be learning some of what goes along with, with uh, having the solar uh, panels um, being run off of the canopies. All right. I wish I could remember the differences between that, but but Mr. Devlin knows and, and, and did tell me today. But uh, there are a lot of details. All right. So this you can take a look here at our enrollment. So this is really exciting. Um, you can see our advanced manufacturing and machine tech. We uh, increased this year by two students, um, and next year um, are increasing again um, with uh, an additional six students overall and a full. 15 students as first year students. Um, our automotive tech uh, this year, we returned to our pre pandemic level um, with a, um, a, a, again, another increase for next year, significant increase next year based on selections at this point. Um, carpentry tech, I can also see um, a return this year to pre pandemic uh, levels with a further increase in selections for next year. Um, carpentry tech and then and then really exciting with electricity this year we went pretty significantly above our pre-pandemic levels um, with a further increase in electricity next year um, all based on um, students from O'Malley and, and other students in the high school choosing to be uh, first year students we would have a full um, you know all, all of our one uh, first year students would be full um, if any of those students drop, there is a wait list. So students from the wait list would be invited to come um, fill those spots if any student decides not to uh, go forward in the fall or if they come off you know, later in the year as well. How big is the wait list? Do you know? Uh, yes, it's about uh, 17, I think, when I looked at it last. Yeah. In total? Total for all the, the shops. Progress. Yep. Okay. That's right. So eat all the shops in the next go. Yes, yeah, based on yeah, the enrollment, they're right now all maxed out. So, when I'll um, actually the next slide, you can see. Um, so, automotive tech, um, we had uh, 42 students select auto as their first choice. We ran the lottery and placed 30 students, the lottery that is part of the admissions. Um, for electricity, which was the, which you know jumped above carpentry tech, uh, that's where we're seeing the greatest increase. Um, 29 students had that as their first choice with 15 students, the maximum place, Carpentry Tech 27, 15 place. And advanced manufacturing, only nine students selected that as their first choice, but other students had it as their second choice. And if they didn't get in one of the other shops, we were able to add students there to, to fill out the advanced manufacturing shop as well. Um, we know that with um, our director coming in, that one of the things we need to do is education around it, advanced manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Like that's, we, we know that's one of our lifts. Uh, we had a lot of momentum there pre-pandemic and we're looking to get back to it, especially with uh, Brenda Wass, like picking up the director role starting July 1st, because it's you just do a tour of that shop and realize how interesting it is for, um, this is exactly the kind of thing a lot of kids are into, um, design, right, using technology, designing, and then making something as well. It has all those combinations for kids. James, Laura has a question. Um, so um, were, was everyone placed into a first or second Choice, or are there kids who students who were not? There, there are students who did not who are on the wait list. So who didn't get into a first or who second didn't get into a first, second, or third choice. Oh wow! Okay, and those are the seventeen. Yep, said. exactly. Yeah, and some people opted not to be on the wait list, right? So you don't all go okay. onto the wait list. Okay. So that's what I counted right before this. It might be changed. We're we're still building the schedule, so. Okay. 
it could for all I know be 18 this moment because of a counselor doing work with kids, but that's where it was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions, James. One is, uh, and you've, you've probably told us this 10 times, retention rate. What is the retention? I mean, the kids. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, it it very much varies, and there is um, a significant when when students have to move. Uh, so first year they have one course, a uh, one block of their seven block day. Their second year they have two. In their third and fourth year, they have three of their seven blocks in the shop. So we tend to see um, it about cut in half about by the time they get to the third and fourth year from who came in. And that's another thing that in our plan moving forward, we want to be able to retain students because our plan is fourth year students should be going out into the workplace, right? And then we're able to keep fit, you know, the, whether it's 30 or 50, you know, 30 in auto, 15 in the other shops. Um, maintain that 15. Um, if we maintain students, we will have too many kids their senior year, but that's where job placement, which we do now, but we want that to be nearly universal for our fourth year students going forward. Which dovetails into my second point is I, it sounds like we do job placement now, and mm -hmm. like I wrote down what are we doing to connect kids to local manufacturers, CNC machine shops. So we have folks come in and present to our students. Um, we also have, um, through the GE grant, we have connections to folks there, and we have uh, the advisories uh, for each shop that have the industry representation on them, and they advise us. That's how we're able to, not just with the, the know-how of the teacher, plus the advisory, allow us to make sure we're purchasing what we need to be preparing students for industry, right? So th those are the other connections. Um, so folks come into classes and give talks um, to about careers in the field and uh, local opportunities. Um, we connect kids again through the um, advisories, have more explicit connections. And then throughout the year, we have students at our level four programs placed. So they're actually working for the second half of the day. EF and G block, they're out of the building at their job sites. Yes, Melissa, go ahead. Thanks, thank you. Um, First, I just want to say, James, I commend you for the progress that is being made in these programs. You promised me in the committee years ago that you were going to put a big effort into these programs, and it's really starting to show, and that makes me very, very excited. Um, my one question is, um, are the students in these programs, are they keeping portfolios? I know you've talked about projects they're working on. Are they keeping track of the projects they're working on with documentation so that when they leave the high school with their certifications, they have something to present to a potential employer. That's a great, that's, that's, a, that's something that uh, the director, so uh, the, our new director and I were talking about. Her background is in graphic design. Her portfolios are unbelievable. They're so great. So yes, we have some of that, Melissa, but I wouldn't say that it's one of the strengths yet of our programs, right? Um, I would say the strength is like walking into the shop and seeing the work kids are doing on a daily basis. So one of the things about bringing Brenda on in particular of any candidate is she has a tremendous expertise in that area. Um, her materials are just right, really, yeah, I mean, it's what she does, right? So, so that's something that's really exciting that she'll be able to add that and bring that to um, each of the shop teachers for whom that might not be, you know, it isn't their area of expertise, right? So um, that's something that I know you had mentioned previously and, and that I talked to Brenda about already. So I'm excited, hopefully, you know, next year at this time, we'll be looking at some of uh, student uh, created materials uh, in this presentation. Great, thank you. I can't wait to meet her. Looking forward to it. Um, so with the auto tech, I'm, I'm curious to know, how does somebody get a car in there? I mean, is there a selection process? Uh, do, you know, if, if the instructor is saying, hey, we need to learn about uh, this kind of problem, let's find a car with that problem. So what we've done during COVID and, and kept doing in this year is we're working on don donation cars right now. Yeah. We haven't opened back up yet. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be one of the things that I work on with Brenda and with uh, Mr. Porter and Mr. Machel about how do, when we open back up again, how how do we open back up mm -hmm. again? Um, because it's been it's been a little while and then we, and we have some more oversight with, um, with our new director. So 
So stay tuned. I'll yeah, be, okay. I'll be, I'll be able so it to, might be different than before. It might be different than before, yeah. exactly. And what we think of is we've learned some things. Um, I know Jack and Bud, uh, supporter Mr. Mayshaw, sure. have some ideas about that. Because one of the things about the donations and the cars, they can they they can work on particular as you were saying, they can work on particular things yeah. based on these donations, yeah. as opposed to just relying on whatever comes well, in. That road history thing was quite amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So there's so a lot of like uh, body work as right. well. That's right. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So if someone's a freshman and they and they're moving on to a sophomore, can they apply to? Yes, they can. Yep, yeah. and they're and they're treated as long as they can um, have two years. Seniors are so sophomores, yes. Juniors, yes. Um, can apply. Uh, rising sophomores, rising juniors, apply to the program, and we have some of those. And they're treated. Um, the the Admissions is blind to that. We don't prefer one, one to another. Oh. I had a few. There were a few more slides. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just, uh, I want to make sure we didn't lose the vision for you know what. Um, second, sorry, I thought I was doing this very efficiently. <laughs> it's okay, I can talk. I can you the it's a lot of words. I, the pictures are over. Uh, it's a lot of words left. Um, you want to? Nope, here we go. Okay, okay, you got it. All right. So uh, last year, we set as our primary long-term goals for CBT and GHS and for Gloucester overall, that we would continue to strengthen and grow our existing programs, but also expand CBT um, to add a program or programs that enroll more students in a broader range of students. So you may, you may remember that. So that's one of the, the goals of bringing on a director. So right now, you know, we have a sustainable improvement plan that involves the equipment, the curriculum, and learning opportunities. We partner with O'Malley, present our programs, um, so students apply to them. As you've seen, we've had quite a bit of, in terms of application. Um, and then we maintain industry and community partnerships with our advisory committees. So what we want to do is we want to strengthen our communication with students and families about our programs. We want, and particularly advanced manufacturing is one that lags behind. Create more of those industry partnerships, Bill, that you were talking about with internships and co-ops, and then create more articulation agreements with some post-secondary institutions, um, as well as be able to track what happens to our graduates better. And that's something that is, you know, we need some administrative capacity to do that, that we'll have with the director. So that's our goal, our first goal. Oh, yes, maximizing funding. It's that one. I have the bar of all your faces under. Um, so goal two, expand the CBT with the additional program or program. So to do that, we have to explore um, a new cost-effective program for students who are not being served by our current programs, which would include practical nursing or health assisting. There are some other programs we'd be looking at as well, but those are cost-effective. They don't take a lot of infrastructure investment and would really serve students that are not currently, um, you know, the area of interest that isn't currently being served, not only by our CBT programs, but isn't being served elsewhere in our curriculum. Uh, to do that, we need to uh, conduct market research uh, by working with the Mass Hire Workforce Board, um, see what students want, uh, then design that program, develop a budget for it, identify what staffing will be needed, seek grants to support this expansion and uh, in partnerships as well. So uh, for job opportunities there, and then we would need to establish uh, program advisory committees just like we have for the other programs. And along the way, we work with uh, uh, Essex North Shore Agriculture at the Technical School um, is part. That's a requirement that that is, and we would anyway. But it's a requirement to expand it. Um, so our likely timeline: um, Year one would be, um, you know, this is for that second goal, doing uh, the background research um, uh, in, in uh, the market, uh, what are students interested in, um, identifying funding, so that uh, hopefully in year two would be able to um, apply for a new program. We would have to finalize what's needed financially, um, set up the facilities and equipment, needing to identify the room and the space in the school where a new program could be housed, um, develop that program of studies so students can apply for it, hire um, the personnel to work in the program, finalize those agreements uh, with um, industry to place students. Um, and make sure we follow up on graduates so that in year three, we could actually enroll students in this program. 
Um, that year two is really important, working very closely with Desi for approval. There are a lot of things you, you know, we can't just do it on our own. We have to get approval for it. So that's why I've outlined those steps here. So next year is year one. Uh, and while this is happening to, to build, to expand the program, uh, bring out at least a new program, all the strengthening will continue. As James already said, I have a lot more uh, leadership and resources, and human resources to do that strengthening. Uh, one piece of that, just to chime in on the strengthening and the partnerships, is so we're um, about to get uh, going in a concrete way on uh, connecting the CBT students program with the uh, EGS that's building back then. So that hopefully happen on two levels. One, in the, in the shorter term, um, building a shed that they built. Um, and then uh, and, and throughout next year, hopefully having um, integrated carpentry and electrical technology involved at, at the school building. So we're hoping to do that. It's not in place yet, but definitely a lot of interest from uh, um, two questions. I can't remember um, if the um, the director who is being hired is a time limited um, hire or if is it a. So right now we have one year of funding on the um, uh, through a knowledge donor. Gia helped us to uh, acquire, and then the plan is to put that. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So that, that's the plan here, and we're going to uh, make it happen. I'm going to go with the plan. Um, the plan. And my second question is, I, James, I don't know if I'm, now that we're in graduation season, I seem to remember last year someone went to an aeronautical, right? Was an aeronautical post, you know, post, yep. um, um, did, that, did that person come out of the CBTE program? I believe yes, so. I believe. I believe it was automotive. Auto, yes, exactly. That's my recollection as well. Okay, yeah, because yeah, I just, it, I was really fascinated by that, and I'm sort of interested in that. It's just the directions that uh, students can go from these programs. That's right. Any more questions? I want to know a little bit more about the uh, the tie-in with Essex, uh, Aggie mm -hmm. Tech. Um, you say it's a requirement? That we consult with them. So, because we're in the same area, when we yeah. that, like in terms of work, uh, the workforce we're developing, we're developing as well as are they and, and the other schools in um, their catchment area. So, when we're looking to expand a program, it's a requirement that, uh, that we coordinate with them, that we they're informed. We uh, they also have great resources. Yeah, sure, um, right. they, they, there's a lot of know how there. Um, so we regularly uh, have connections with. Uh, would, would, it, would there be something that would you know prevent us from from say expanding in a certain area because of what they're doing? I mean, in, that would be uh, part of as long as there's a workforce need, mm -hmm. which the areas that I, the examples I gave are areas in which there's a larger need than being met currently. The yeah. you know, the nursing, the medical, the technical area. Um, that's just that's some preliminary conversations with the state about that without crunching the numbers yet. There's yeah. plenty of need there, so it wouldn't prevent us. It could. I mean, there there is a possibility of there being certain fields that we wouldn't be able to. The state would say no because there isn't the workforce need there, mm -hmm. or that workforce need is covered by you know, uh, the regional local school in Essex Tech. But uh, that's not any of the places we're looking. But that is yeah. awesome. Um, Melissa has a question. You're muted. You're muted, Melissa. Thank you. Sorry, not a question, but more of a clarification. So when we joined Essex Tech years ago with the new school, we are in a contract with them. And part of the contract language is that we cannot compete with their programs, oh. with the exception of the programs that we have already. Um, so if, if we're going to expand and go and offer a program that Essex Tech has, we have to get the vote of their school committee in addition to working with DESA. Sure but there is that requirement under our contract with them. Yeah. But I'm sure it won't be a problem. And when you're working with Dr. Riccio, she's going to be more than happy to have offerings to other students because their programs are full. We, we help them recruit. 
I'm pretty sure they'll be helpful in helping us in developing yeah. the program. This, this I, just, I didn't know if you had a copy of that agreement on file, just so that you know there's certain language that we have to. Right. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll track it down. I, I haven't seen it, but we'll track it down. Thank you, Melissa. That's helpful. I had this thought, um, you know, as far as uh, graduates, um, about perhaps like a special alumni night for, for just the vocational programs. Do you have anything like that? Um, you know, that's something we have. We haven't had a, a night. Um, we have uh, alumni who come back to the school to speak to our students from different programs, including a vocational program in January is the time when we, but not, you know, something yeah, like really showcase. Like some kind of mixer, you know, yeah. like, hey, this is where I got, you know, just to like, it, it's a, you know, part on the kids, you know, like, this is where you could be, this is how far I've gotten, you know, this is what I'm doing with my life. Certainly great when uh, some of the businesses that come in to recruit our students uh, are you know represented by our former students yes. right? yeah. and all that right that's frequent right including teachers in our program too but yeah all of that that's that's I like that idea thank you all right thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. good stuff okay um, the next item of business is O'Malley Innovation Middle School end of year student learning update of principal can be and more I'm blanking on your last name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me back so soon. I feel like I was just here. You'll run it for me. So it's thanks. Um so the what you're looking at just to start is um, this is one of the exhibitions from our evening of excellence. This is a sixth grade math class in which students illustrated their learning for the year. Uh, so if you weren't able to make that next year, be sure to be there. Um, we're going to talk about several pieces from our um, plan this year. So just to refresh your memory, we've been through these of our three focus areas are improving student learning, student engagement, and professional collaboration. And our strengths, um, you know, still, still the same categories. We've accomplished some things this year under our strengths. Um, with you know progress we've made with the literacy review, social emotional support, and in implementing our SEL center um, with STEM and critical and creative thinking, we have expanded our science center, our PACE program. I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, the success we've had with the number of days that students would have been out of school that, in which they were in school. Um, as people talked about earlier, our band concerts were phenomenal. The musicals was phenomenal. It's really exciting to have our arts back in place. Um, and then our leadership team is focusing on growth. So first, just quickly, a few points of, of what work we've accomplished and are working on with professional collaboration. Um, primarily, I wanna highlight the work of the Literacy Review Committee that um, Maura did a spectacular job facilitating. We are gonna be ready to go to pilot products in the fall with an implementation in the spring. So a lot of work was done this year around that. Um, and then the second highlight on this slide is the um, continuation of our PLC process with student success plans in our weekly, I'm sorry, every six days there's a meeting among the house teachers. So this year we were able to implement um, 42 plans, 19 of which almost half of them were complete, closed up in four to six weeks with success. And the remainder, most are ongoing. Um, there were some glitches around mental health issues coming in and some different things came up that we'll have to figure out how to address and deal with, not necessarily things we have control of over at school as well. Um, but that's a, a pretty good ratio for our first real work with, with success plans for kids. Um, with regard to student engagement, one of our focus areas, um, the, the one I want to focus on mostly here are, are two things, um, community meetings by house, um, during which advisory groups just decided on many, many different service learning projects. And many of you may remember the day of service that we used to have in the fall where everybody went out raking leaves, even though we didn't really have enough houses to rake. Mm -hmm. um, this year, people did a variety of things like create, um, make two toys for dogs with your picture. Um, and, uh, you know, do book drives, um, send letters to, to folks around town, um, gather food, and, and do all kinds of different kinds of projects with, um, by advisory, kids decided what their projects were going to be, and we'll be expanding that again next year. 
Um, also with related, with regard to student engagement on that one, um, the PACE program. So um, this year, a total of 53 students um, were in school for 69 days. So that's 69 days of learning that were, were not lost uh, by kids who had some sort of egregious conduct uh, incident that caused a suspension, but we were able to keep them in and learning instead of at home on the couch playing video games. So um, that's definitely a success for us. We did run for the second year um, a three-part student climate survey. Um, so students are asked a series of questions. I wanna say there's 40 odd questions on the survey in different categories, self-awareness, social awareness, self-regulation, relationship skills, responsible decision-making, student engagement, adult respect, student respect, adult support and safety. Um, so it's a little bit similar to the survey that they take at the end of MCAS in eighth grade, but ours is um, broader. So there's a couple of highlights that I think we should be proud of. Um, this one, there's at least one trusted adult in the building who I can talk to. 82% of our students have that. We want it to be 100%, but that's a good starting point for us. Um, I feel safe while at school, 81%. Again, we'd like that higher. The survey, by the way, was administered um, right after the, the Friday of the week of the Texas shooting. So um, mm -hmm. although the numbers were you know, pretty steady across the year, um, I, I'm sure I'm wondering what the reflection would be if that hadn't been the case on that Friday. Um, on this next slide, um, of course, the O'Malley Academy shines, but the third question, there are lots of chances for kids to do things after school. 89% of the kids find a lot of that. Two places where we have work to do, we've already started talking and thinking about getting kids um, more engaged. That's where most of what I learn is interesting and my teachers connect what I'm doing to the outside classroom and data teams today. Um, there were a lot of conversations about, and actually each of the math data meetings started with an exploration that was an estimation activity that, that got everybody thinking and the conversations revolved around how do we get kids hooked? Um, the Ignite strategy from Zaretta Hammond, getting them right involved with, with doing something and getting their thinking going and being creative about it. So that's that's on our desk to, uh, to focus on in the future next year. Um, and then this last piece, um, this is where we have some, our greatest concerns and we have some work to do. Um, the rules and school-wide expectations for behavior are very clear is only 77%. It should be higher, although still in the green in terms of the way we look at percentages on these kinds of surveys. Um, but the students respecting one another only being at 60% this spring and students think it's important to follow rules being 45%. I think that's reflective of this year in particular of the challenges that many schools have faced around conduct issues. Um, and it's certainly a focus that we've got right in our radar. The next portion of the presentation, I'm gonna turn over to Maura. She's gonna talk through the data that we've collected around uh, particularly reading and math and learning. Uh, the slides we're going to share with you are very similar to these slides. That, can I ask a question before you move yeah. on to that? Just a quick question. Um, are these survey results shared with all the teachers and staff? Um, the spring has not been yet, but it, they will be. Yeah. So um, we continue our work on the curriculum review, uh, in, particularly in the area of literacy. And I'll highlight some things uh, in the coming slides that are, are starting to indicate the, the movements that we're seeing uh, around literacy. Our you know, objectives throughout the curriculum review have been to really look at scope and sequence, to look at materials and resources and tools that we're using to look at uh, teaching strategies, not just uh, in ELA classes, but in literacy across all content areas. Um, and we are at the point we're meeting on Monday to make final uh, arrangements for what our next steps are going to be for, for piloting in the fall. So we're very excited about that. We did um, some work with Keys to Literacy over the course of the school year, which you may recall, we had a focus on two column notes. But it's been really interesting as the, the teachers across every content area have have been incorporating two column note taking into their instruction. Students are, are anecdotally sharing uh, with teachers and, and with their classmates how 
for a lot of kids, the strategy is connecting with them and helping them organize information in, in a manner that is, is much more um, succinct and clear for them. A few of them, even on the evening of excellence, chose that as their topic that they wanted to share with uh, incoming students and with guests. So that was exciting to see the impact that that small step has, has made. For data teams, we started that in the fall and have been continuing on um, really creating and refining the process of looking at student data from a number of different perspectives, from the, the standards uh, alignment and scope and sequence, what standards are we really successful with, what standards are do we need to move around because we're not hitting at the appropriate time, and what standards do we continue to need more work and what are the steps we need to do to make those changes, and also how does that line up with the tools and resources that, that we are, are using, and, you know, going back again to literacy review and the upcoming math review. So our student growth data, we're going to start with ELA, and like I said, these are the slides um, that you have seen a few months ago, but we've just added in the spring data. So we'll start with sixth grade ELA. So uh, what we're seeing is fluctuation. Um, our students in the not meeting uh, category, they came in at about 13%. There was a dip in the winter, they're back up to 13%. But the important thing to note with all of this is that the bar keeps getting higher every time they take it. So the bar for um, not meeting or partially meeting or meeting expectations was at one point uh, in the fall, then it was at a different point in the winter and it's at the highest uh, peak now. So, so they're continuing to um, you know, move in and hopefully remain on par if not further from that bar. Um, so that's our sixth grade uh, ELA data. And the next slide is a, a longitudinal look at it. So you can see with the blue bars where the children left at the end of last year. So we're looking to see what has that change been over with the cohort all the way from the end of their previous school year to the end of this common school year. All right, just one. Sure. So spring, so that was when they were in fifth grade? The blue is when they were in fifth grade. Okay, yeah. So you compile the data from all the schools. Yep. Yeah. Okay, got it. And we can continue that process now because we can we can track this cohort over the course of several years to see what um, you know what steps we're taking, what's working and not working, and, and make adjustments in real time. So our seventh grade uh, data, you you see. Um, some plateaus there, we don't see quite the, the dips and, and rises that we saw before, but statistically it's all very close. And again, with that bar continuing to rise, we that's what you hope to see if not greater gains. So, so it's good that we're not losing ground there. This is a longitudinal look at our seventh graders. Um, you know, at the end of sixth grade, you can see a, a point to highlight here is when they left sixth grade, um, there was 26% scoring in that not meeting category. Uh, it dropped down in the fall to 14, and we've been able to keep kids out of that band uh, throughout the course of the school year. And you can see the rises on the other end. Yes. Quick question, Margaret. Snapshot, if you can, for me, you said, the bar continually moves. Like, how does that, does that skew the results at all? Or am I missing something? No, it doesn't, it, it skews, it doesn't skew the results. It just, it, it frames how we look at it. So the similar to M, um, MCAS over the course of, of uh, several years, there's sort, certain cut points for each category, the cut points change. So let's say that you scored in the, 60th percentile nationally you scored higher than 60 percent of all other yeah. seventh grade students who, who took this assessment back in the fall that 60 percent might have had you meeting or exceeding um falling into that category but in the spring you're only that that same 60 percent you're, you're only falling into the partially meeting so so the bar keeps rising of how what you have to attain to to move over to those meeting and exceeding categories. Uh, and the notion is that because you should have gained more fluency or more knowledge mm -hmm. or more, you know, and I, I, I'll try this analogy if it may not work, we'll see. As you're, you're, when your kids are young and they're being measured against, you know, um, size or, or length or height, okay, like right. that, where, the, where there should be in terms of a normal range, 
continues to change because they are growing older and getting bigger. So in this case, because you're further along in the school year, what partially meeting is is higher than what partially meeting was earlier. Is that helping? Yes. I think of it as if it were completely flat from fall to spring, the test gets harder through the year. So that means if I'm flat, that means I'm staying, I'm, I'm growing perfectly appropriate along with the grade level. So we want our kids to grow more than that because we want to at a higher level, but they're they're growing progressively with the grade level. Yeah. So. Definitely, we definitely want to be aiming to get more and more kids to meet this. Yep. That's the goal. Yep. And this, and you, you're going to keep going with the data, so yep. I don't want to slow you down. But just from what we've seen with six and seven, so um, so less than fifty percent mm -hmm. in all grades are meeting. Our targets, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then lumped in this, say what we're looking at now, we've got forty-one percent this spring meeting and exceeding. So in that forty-one percent are the kids who are sort of solid, and then there's the kids who are, you know, exceeding that, and they're they're together in there, and there's differentiation happening for them. Or okay, and there's also a tension on the, you know. The, we go down to the student level with all of this and and how we're looking at it when there's fluctuation, you know, particularly in the partially meeting category. Well, where did those kids go? How many of the kids that moved out of the partially meeting moved into the meeting or exceeding? And, and what was that gain? Or if they fell back, what was what was the you know decrease if there is one um, that caused them to to land in another band? So we're looking at the all the way down to, to the student level. And now just the summer, I'm also looking at like, it looks like there's a drop off, which I think is expected, right? In some summer, you know, from, from spring to fall, but it looks like the partially meeting kids here in this one didn't. And I'd be curious to know if they, if these were kids who were tapped for summer school, you know, for programs mm -hmm. that help with that. So yeah, that's excellent question. Wondering. <laughs> And it certainly informs what our effective strategies over the summer are. Right, right. Our, our eighth grade ELA data for the course of the year, you can see that the um, students came in in the fall, 15% um, not meeting, 48% partially meeting, 37% meeting. And then you can see the adjustments over the course of, of the school year and pretty consistent growth um, between winter and, and spring. Again, we want to continue to close that gap. So we're looking for ambitious growth, not just regular expected growth, but um, it gives, this certainly informs our, our instruction. And this screen just is another illustration of this cohort of students and where they left off in seventh grade. Um, Let's see, on the MCAS, the high needs population uh, was, was really an area that was targeted for us in the past. So we're also um, working to disaggregate this data and pull out exactly where our students um, that fall into a high needs category for a variety of reasons and, and what that distribution looks like as well. And that's what you'll see on the next slide. We've seen, this is a similar to a slide that we showed you in um, the winter. There are adjustments. We've seen growth in each category, modest growth, but but we're seeing that growth in, in all of the categories, moving closer and closer to meeting and exceeding. For math, we have um, fluctuations, which we are ex kind of to be expected because we've really concentrated on literacy uh, this year. But the same trajectory, you can see uh, the students meeting and exceeding came in at 40% in the fall, and it's it's elevated to 43%. Um, we want to see, continue to see that rise. This is the longitudinal information for those students, 41% um, leaving uh, fifth grade last year at meeting or exceeding, and now you know, 43 for, for where we stand right now. Our seventh grade math, you see a fluctuation, um, consistently maintaining in the, the not meaning category and then some variations in the partially meaning and the meaning and exceeding for math. 
and what it looked like for our, our students when they left sixth grade. So they came in at 35%, um, or they left uh, sixth grade at 35% meeting or exceeding in. And then you can see the dip and then the, the rise in the dip again in that, within that category. And our eighth grade, very similar. Where, you know, one of the things that we have done throughout our, our data meetings and looking at this is looking at patterns. And we can definitely see the roller coaster pattern um, across the uh, fall, winter, and, and spring testing. And how much of that is test fatigue with, with them taking these assessments you know, right off of, of their, their multiple days of MCAS testing. So we're looking at testing windows and, and how can we move that around to make sure that um, we're maximizing student performance and making sure that we're getting the most accurate reflection of their abilities. And this is a longitudinally, you can see with our, our eighth graders um, coming in at meeting, excuse me, leaving seventh grade at 32% meeting and exceeding and leaving um, eighth grade at 39. One of the things, especially when you're embarking on this process, it's change process and, and really trying to follow the data and see what it tells us is we're looking at it in those snapshots from a very, um, very high level. And when you're looking at the change process, you start to see baby steps first. So did we see any baby steps in here that are a really good indication that we're, you know, we're on the right path? Um, and I think our growth data in literacy really speaks to that. So what we have here is a chart for, this is the growth data for all students K to um, eight for, for the school year. So in the ELA for our growth data for, um, the sixth through eighth graders, we, we scored in the 57th uh, percentile was the median growth data, which is great. And while we're not seeing necessarily the shift between bands that we, we were hoping to see, what we're looking for is are they moving? And um, you know, across the district, we're seeing that, that they're made significant gains in, in that area of growth. Math is the area where we're, we're falling behind our counterparts at the elementary level um, in the math growth. But again, that's where you know, we're, we're leaving in that effort in the fall with our, our math curriculum review. Just a question on that graph, just so I understand sure. the previous one. So student growth percentiles, so is, as a percentile, I'm assuming it's based on 100. Yes, it's, it's a median based on 100. Okay, so this is this is the growth from where they were to where they mm -hmm. are, not on us. Okay, okay, thank you. So just to dovetail into sure. that. So the so the blue column it's the is it the same students? No, that's our current elementary okay. students. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. You know, because we're looking to see what are the trends across the district and in a when we're trying to measure our growth and, and where we're successful and, and where we're keeping par across the district, or if, if we're not keeping par uh, across the district, we wanna look at, at the totality of, of growth. So we, we really, um, is, we find that elementary information very useful to us in helping us in our trends. What you're, what you're aiming for on, on in the growth percent of 60 or above. Mm -hmm. That's considered high, you know, high or faster growth. Okay, so you see we're on sort of verge of that in a couple of these. ELA, uh, K, so a 6 to 8 EL, six to eight ELA and um, K to 5 math, right? But that's just so you know that, that that's where you're aiming, 60 yep. or above on that to see a growth. That, that's really where, you know, uh, kids are growing, growing at a rate faster than their peers, so to speak. And a significant rate faster than their peers. What, what, we're, what they're doing here, I think this is right, and, and Greg or Maura, correct me, is that this is a comparison to other kids in other places doing STAR. This is a national one. Yeah. Okay. That was yeah. like, I didn't want to sound like a dummy. But no, no, not at all. My next question so different was, assessments work with them, so that's a good question. Right. Well, and, we, and, well, we compared ourselves to the and Anything from 50 and above is, is positive growth relative to their national peers. Good. So it's not, we're not looking for hundred percent on something like this. That's not, okay. That's it's not talking, we're not talking about mastery. We're not talking about scaled scores. We're simply saying of all the students, 
and all the districts that use star 360 um, you know where do our students fall relative to you know that yep. that median yep. and um, anything above 50 is is it is in the good and anything right. above 60 is considered very strong and you will rarely see you know 70 80 90 something like that that would be extraordinary so that, we're that not often students. happens if a student has been a student or students or group of students have been doing very very poorly for whatever right. reason. Right. And then they have to, you know, it, it, and then they can grow with accelerate the right support really fast. Right. And that's that's the group of students you'll see who have the 70 or plus for ethics. Right. So, yeah. And so while we're, you know, this is an indication that we're moving in the right direction and we'll see those bands changing over time, which is, you know, the, the bigger picture of what we're looking for. And then this is just a snapshot again of our high need students and, and the adjustments um, in winter and the categories that they're falling up, falling into and indicating you know, where with our high need students do we need to concentrate our efforts and analyze um, how best to support them. Okay. The, um, you're grouping um, students with disabilities with economically disadvantaged what was the what's the purpose of that? No, the MCAS category. So our, oh. our high needs categories are um, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, and English language learners. So our English language learners in these statistics, the percentages were too low to be statistically significant. I mean numbers and, of students. And these are what's that? I mean numbers of students. Numbers of students and and, and they're who participated, yeah. Yep. And um, in our past performance in the, the 2019 MCAS that we were comparing to um, our English language learners were not considered, um, they, they did well as compared to these two categories, these two demographics. So not lumped together as much as it's these are the high needs categories. But that's high needs students is the umbrella, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the umbrella term for those three categories. Yeah, the state students. considers a student to be high needs if um, they fall under any one or more of those three categories. So when you look at cluster data, like if you go to the state, and you look at our data, it's, it's in these categories. Mm -hmm. Like that's just a state. It's the way the uh, MCAS cookie uh, crumbles. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's basically, it's ultimately, when um, this, this is not a lot of things that shifted over the last 25 years, right? Or 30 years is, is in not only in education, but in many other fields. It was just a, a better understanding of not only data, but how to use data. And so basic disaggregation is, if we're just looking at, at, at the whole, being all students, and don't look at that, of course, then it is it is likely or possible you are hiding deficiencies, okay? And so you disaggregate, you disaggregate by grade, you disaggregate by boys or girls, you disaggregate by, um, uh, your race or class, you disaggregate by, um, in this case, subgroups, you know, um, high needs or special education. And that's in order to, for us to learn and have a closer understanding of uh, maybe doing really well with eighth graders, but not that well with seventh graders. Okay, we maybe do really well with high needs students, but not that well with English language learners. And if you, unless you disaggregate, you will be masking the uh, places that are str of strength and also places of, of particular strength and places that. Uh, maybe per, per, per deficient. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a basic approach in any sort of data analysis to understand, have a deep understanding of how you're doing anything. That could be sales, that could be, you know, in terms of regions, right. you know, or sectors, that could be um, I, I, I lots of things. So. Um, so this is just, again, we've, we've shown this before, this is our plan, and we're going to continue with it next year. It's literacy and math. Again, focusing on the tier one, adding the math intervention into company the literacy intervention, and then expanding the scaling so that we can continue you know, the, the, the modest growth that we started to make and expand that. And these are the places that we're going um, to improve everything. We've again gone through this before. I don't want to be redundant, um, but we're continuing to push along with our curriculum reviews, our professional development focus on understanding uh, universal design for learning and our literacy, bringing math in, continuing with the assessments. Today's conversation at the data teams was a little bit about our, our report card grades to see 
you know, how we can make them um, a better measurement of what students are actually learning. So perhaps it's an assessment grade and a practice grade. So we can um, delineate between when kids are, are getting the handle of things and getting their work done and their effort versus what do they actually learn. So that's a helpful data point to us along with STAR and along with some other pieces. Um, so one thing that um, sort of interested me, how many days of testing do they have? Um, it depends. So MCAS is two days per subject when uh, eighth grade has science in addition to, the, to English to math. Um, the STAR testing takes a day for math and a day for English, three times a year. Um, and then English has an additional day for a writing benchmark. That's 13, I said. 13, that's eight total? Grade, yeah. 13, eight grade, 13 days. But they're, are they full days? Or? No, no, no. No, I didn't think so. Yeah, no. So, so it's 13, 13, 13 times. It's a single block. So in their English class today, you're going to have tests. In your other classes, we've got regular instruction. But is that MCAS full day? No. Nope. MCAS can, it, it runs the gamut from yeah. a couple of hours to, it, it's very student dependent, right? Yeah, but anywhere from 45 minutes to that. So, so it'd, be, it'd be better to say 13 sessions. So yeah, sessions, more, yes. Yeah. Because it can be more than a fast period, and gas can be more than a fast period, but star is a fast yeah, the period. Other, the other assessments are just are a separate class period. And that's the most, most because of eighth grade is science. Um, you're taking just an MCAS day off for fifth or sixth and seventh? Because you don't have science. You you don't have the, yeah, the only grade that tests in science is eighth. So you take off two sessions for seven. And two sessions, yeah, yeah. And for six, yeah. So, because you, you said, you know, we don't know if it's testing fatigue. And I thought that was interesting yeah. because it's a lot of testing, um, which I know MCAS are, you know, I, I'm not offering a solution really. That's the one I'd get rid of. I right. Test. No, I know. Um, but it's, I mean, as a parent, I saw the sort of elementary lead up to MCAS. And I can't imagine, you know, what's different in middle school, but I have an idea. Um, so, I just, I just thought that was an interesting data point that these kids are being tested and tested and tested. Um, and I don't know if it's more difficult or more stressful for kids who are struggling more, but I think it could be. Um, so I just wonder if there's any thing to do about it. I, I think I'm hearing it differently than you are, Laura. I'm not hearing they're testing and testing and testing. I'm hearing there are, there are sessions. 13 and days that have a session is still a day when you have a session that you know you have a big test. So I'm just I'm just asking because you said there could be some fatigue. I, would, if we, I, would, I don't consider the fatigue to be related to stress as much as they don't care anymore how they do all the tests because they, they're tired of mm -hmm. that, that particular activity. I see. Yeah. And, and Laura, were you at, were you saying that specifically because they just done MCAS and shortly after MCAS they were doing STAR? Yes. Is that what you're? When you, so we're we're looking at everything. We're looking at how when we see a, a student that has a significant discrepancy in their performance in the winter and their performance in the spring, or what the teacher is seeing in class and what the teacher, you know, the report that we're one of the first things we're doing is looking at. Well, how long did they take on this? Because if we're looking in, you took four minutes right. on this. We know that that's not an accurate representation. Right. We might not be able to do much about it in the moment, but. We want to factor everything in because at the end of the day, our goal is to make sure that we're giving you everything you need to be successful. And if we have to revamp our assessment strategy in some way to, to help with that, we want to look at how, you know, every possible consideration. Okay. That makes sense. I'm just sort of processing it. Sure. So, thank I, you. I just want to follow up just a little bit um, from all the presentations we've had on FCAS over the years. Um, you know, one of the examples of how to improve was are we pacing our, our lessons correctly? Mm -hmm. Are we testing, are they being tested on things we haven't got to? Mm -hmm. And this may be another factor mm -hmm. that may come up. So it's um, so it's all information that helps improve either our where we put in instruction or how we do instruction when we do the assessments so that we, yeah, so it's, 
Well, it's one, one it's a the, lot of information. Yeah, that can one of the pieces of data that we get from STAR that we don't get the same way from MCAS is what is it that they struggled with on this assessment? So mm -hmm. there's a report for every kid that tells you which standards they had trouble with so we can look at it and we, you know, we get a report on all of their performance, not the, not the individual questions per se, but the information on each of the standards they were tested on so that we can look at it and say, you know, do we teach that in November and never go back to it? Or, you know, or did the, did the student spend 14 minutes or, you know, much less time than they should? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and, and see what we can do to, to change that up. Because the information we get from is really valuable for that student and for students overall. And you get it more quickly too. Right? It's yeah. immediate. Right. And it also tells us what's going well. Our, our students, when we drill down to those standards, their vocabulary development standards over the course of, of the year have grown exponentially. And that's great news. And so we were able to have conversations about what does that look like? How is the instruction taking place that's influencing that? And how do we replicate in that, that in other areas? So it, it's, it gives us, it gleans a lot of information for us. There are definitely benefits to it. Yeah. Do you have a question? No, I mean, I guess when I look at this data, I sort of, it's hard for me not to think about sort of where they are developmentally. And I sort of think about sixth and seventh grade being sort of brought with lots of challenges um and there being a big difference in maturity and resiliency between sixth and eighth grade and sort of i noticed that there was some more consistency in the eighth grade data than the sixth and seventh grade data and so i just sort of been wondering i don't know if this is a question or a comment but do you sort of is there room for that in your analysis just thinking about sort of what kids are going through socially and emotionally in sixth and seventh grade and in eighth grade, but it seems like there's a there's a jump in maturity and resiliency. In this particular set of data, yes, that hasn't always been the case. Yeah. Um, but yes, everything comes into play. Why is it with this particular group of kids that they were able to maintain, or what is it that we did in instruction, or how the classes were structured, and there are always questions that that's those are the conversations that happen to try and figure out what it is that caused either the positives or the negatives in, in the demonstration of learning. Right. Thank you. So just to wrap up, if I, if I can, um, I want to say, sort of say something out loud that perhaps some folks are thinking. I, I know that, that um, Warren and Lynn are, is two things that really need to go together. And Tim to Tong was a part of it, which is these aren't good enough results. Mm -hmm. You know, below 50% of kids meeting Expectations is not good enough, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we know that, and I think you know that. And at the same time, the work that the, this team has gotten going this year is the right work to impact that in a in a in a, in a important way over time, and we have to. And you know, we'll continue to work together, you know, as a team. Uh, continue to work with the uh, staff, and digital mailing. Both to understand, you know, where these kids, where, where middle school kids are developmentally, because it's so important. Um, I've been a middle school teacher. I mean, these are they are lovable, fun kids, and at and, and a different level of maturity. That, that literally is in the middle of elementary and, 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 and you know, teaching high school, right? Um, which makes a lot of fun, but it also means that you have to know these kids well and do the instructional work, the review of ELA, and the instructional work focus you talk about the training support you do the data analysis that you describe it and really do it you know that's the, i think that's the first time folks have come to you uh, in a long time talking about really do those things and the teachers are doing it and they're getting the hang of it and we're seeing um, an impact on it and so both those things are really important but uh, the, the primary one is we need to do that i think the only information we had historically was MCAS. And that's you know not actionable. It's way after the fact. It's comparing to the state. It's not really dissecting how the child is moving through their school year and the skills they're acquiring or not acquiring. So I'm pleased to see the similar presentations as we've been getting for elementary, which have really made a big difference in the way um, kids are learning. I think that was the last word. No, it wasn't the last word. Was it the last word? It was. It was a nice frame. Yeah. Um, just thinking about the conduct data or the survey. Um, and I know, I mean, 
again, you are as professionals, but I've been reading so much about how this, this two-year, three-year period has impacted especially middle school students, mm -hmm. especially at that age group. I mean, as you said, this is happening all over the country. Um, are there, you know, I can only imagine that that impacts all of this, right? Because yes. that's their social emotional health and everything they're experiencing in this moment of great tumult. Um, you know, I'm assuming that there's like sort of national, statewide or national um, sort of people looking at how, how to rebuild um, for these students, I mean, who are struggling in these ways and the conduct is part of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I know, I know that we put a lot into the social emotional piece this year and moving forward. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess it's sort of a question and comment. How do you see that, you know, the adjusting, hopefully, out of this really intense period at school? How do you see that as playing a role in improving what we're doing? Oh, I think it's essential that I mean, we, we have to get a handle on that. Kids have to get a handle on and figuring out how to do school again. Um, I don't have a good answer to that. I, I haven't never found anyone yet that has one. I think we all knew there was going to be impact, and I don't think anyone will continue to see more and more as time goes on how grave that impact is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to paint a dismal picture, but no. it, it's you know it's going to be every day thinking about where are we, what can we try, mm -hmm. what can we do differently. You know, how do we engage the kids more? And I think you know, all of us who work with kids think that if kids aren't engaged, of course, that all these other things are, are not going to happen. So, so what do we do better? Um, and that's our focus has to be on community, on connection, on relationship, on giving the kids a voice, on the adult conversations that we're having where the adults are trying to figure out what it is they can change up to have kids be more invested, invest, invested again, like they, they used to at the level they might have been in before pandemic um, to get them really involved in their learning. Some of today's conversations at data teams are about the, uh, you know, the fact that they don't necessarily understand the value of them. why do we ask you to do it? We just took two days of them passing two sessions and now two days later we're doing another test. You know, it doesn't feel necessary to them because it's, you know, they're, they're not the ones doing the analysis. So how do we get them involved in that? Um, having conversations about their data, all of those kinds of things to, to connect them to. Right. Do you have a question to answer? I know that. Oh, no, it's, you know, <laughs> if, if I had one, I'd, I'd make a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it? I, yeah, just a quick comment. Um, uh, first of all, I appreciate you attending the meetings and you always bring I probably a little bit different in that you bring a lot of data, you bring a lot of verbiage to the meetings and your slides and stuff. All day data driven and I'm probably more of a, you know, let's take, let's, let's try plan B or something, you know, just you're much more thorough than I am. Um, and I think you have a very difficult job. I did write down two things that I think, and uh, Barbara just touched on it is, um, the discipline or, the, or the, the respect thing and the following the rules things. I looked at those as kind of just red lights. I was like, wow, that's a big, that's a low percentage of kids that put value on that. And then the other thing I wrote is um, one of the questions I think was what's uh, most of what I learned is interesting. And I, uh, something along those lines. I think, and I thought, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that, that's interesting to me in that what I've seen at the elementary level is the kids became more engaged, the more interested they were in what they were learning, it kind of triggered, hey, I'm kind of into this now. And, um, and then I back into, well, we're going to try some pilot type programs. And I'm like, well, maybe that, you know, maybe, maybe it all comes together. You know, we throw the ball and mix it up and it comes together. But very concerned about just the, the respect thing, respect for each other, mm -hmm. respect for teachers, and the following the rules type things. Yeah. And I think that's that's newer since pandemic. It's almost like the time out of school caused kids to forget that they're part of a community in school and we haven't you know, rebuilt that yet. So those those two questions are alarming. Um, 
and they they're important for us to, to work with kids on. So it's conversations with kids to say, you know, what changes this? And I've had some of those just to think about the kinds of things that that help them feel like they want to do what's going on in class. Um, so just to that, you know, those are conversations that we need to have around respect, right? Like that is like a community wide conversation that yes. needs to be had, right? We just as a culture have lost some sense of respect and decency yeah, just in yeah. terms of, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, so I think it's, we have these interesting sort of expectations for our students, but we don't have the same expectations for the adults in the room. Yeah, and the kids are certainly reflecting. Yeah, absolutely, they see it, they hear it, they feel it. Um, and I think we just, we really need to remember that, that, you know, respect in general is something that we have to get back to in, in the way that we uh, interact with each other. Um, and it doesn't surprise me at all, right? That data, it was like a huge red flag for you. And I was like, yeah, it makes total sense. Like it makes sense, but it's <laughs> yeah, still it's, it's concerning, it but it makes total sense to me that like, this is trickling down to our students right. and it's causing significant um, disrepair in our schools, for sure. So. Well, I respect you and the work you do. Outstanding work, much appreciated. Keep at it. Yeah, um, I have questions about uh, the questionnaire as well. It's about a questionnaire. Um, you know, it wasn't really clear to me whether when they were asked these questions, are they answering on behalf of themselves or reflecting on what they feel the student body is say respecting the rules like is that like i don't know I, i'd like to see the questionnaires i don't sure. know how they were posed yeah. there are so there's some of each so there yeah. are some questions where students at this school yeah etc right. and then there are other i questions right so yeah okay. and um similar concerns to, to both the yeah. like counterparts here about about the degradation of, of respect uh, among peers and, and, and teachers mm -hmm. and the rules. Um, I mean, pandemic is, is, is like an easy answer to why that's become more of a problem, but um, you know, you have to put it in combination, I think, with, with uh, social media, I think. It, it's just too easy to be disrespectful online. And, and that seems to be permeating into, into you know, culture amongst each other. Um, and, and I think pandemic made, made, made it, it all the worse. And it could be, and I think it started a long time ago and just exasperated. Uh, I pronounced that right. Um, but yeah, it's concerning. Just wanted to remark on that. And I'm curious about the, the questionnaire itself. Um, what is, uh, I, I asked myself this question. I don't understand what it means to be asked. Uh, the term social awareness. What is is the category of social awareness is is for kids it's about you know their relationship standing so how they relate to other kids how other kids relate to them so those are the kinds of questions that that fall under that category thank you thank you thank you guys so much thank you very much thank you very much thanks for your work Continue the next uh setting on the agenda is update on, of attendance and catch up. Are you having your packet known from me? Yes. Uh describing at length. Um uh just somewhere I should say. Um Uh, so, so just uh, sort of stepping back for a second, um, your school committee policy, JC, is about school catchment areas. So these are the areas uh, defined around the city that determine where uh, students go to elementary school. <coughs> Having one middle school, one high school, we don't have you know, citywide, obviously. Um, and in, the, uh, in that school committee policy, uh, you call for updating school hands catchment areas in certain, in certain times. And listed here, obvious, the most important one here being um, uh, number three, the opening of the school. 
but also over kind of condition in existing school. You could you could say that you know compared to others, uh, West Harris has some of this. Okay, um, so we'll talk about a little bit about that. But really, the most significant in driving is the consolidation of these peace foster veterans. Okay, um, and also uh, the need to make sure that school is fully utilized, um, like like all schools be fully utilized. So the process underway, which at this point is information gathering and and really information gathering, and then we'll continue with this summer was launched to look at. Uh, versions of the update that we do. doing. Um, it's very important that this is an update. It's not a whole scale revision of any any way, shape, or form of the, of the catchment areas. So it really will be around the fringes. And I'll, I'll just show that in a moment, just sort of the basic concept. Um, so we're going to use various forms of information. So obviously, the, the, the current enrollment by school tenants and catchment areas. Um, currently, we're looking at that already. We'll kind of share that you know, with the viewing community as we go along. Um, current enrollment at each, at each school and also by grade level to see where we have some pinch points or where we don't. Um, city census data for ages zero to five. So what we can expect just given what, what who was born in Gloucester in zero to five years ago. That's good data, not great data, because of course people have, have children and move away. Their families, you know, move and others, others move in, that sort of thing. But it does give us some indication of things. Um, and then um, another piece is there. Earlier, there was there were, there were been proposed zoning changes in, in front of uh, city council. Um, not many of those have been passed as it has played out. Um, in talking to the planning department, um, you know, they've explained to me that, that we don't they don't anticipate any big shifts because of those. In other places I've worked, they've had um, you know large like 40B or large um, housing complexes being built that were you know. Uh, you know, mixed use, mixed size, mixed you know, um, mixed bedrooms, and all sorts of things. Um, Gloucester have that in, in the works at this point um, that we did be looking at. It. You know, if we had another halyard, we'd be looking that closely, but we don't at this point. And any zone change and zone, zone change that have been adopted recently, which are very minimal, um, it's we don't expect that to, to generate you know mass numbers. Today. Um, Oh, the other, other, sorry, the last piece actually is on the slide, but we also look at, at you know, previous uh, enrollment projections. We were a few years old, but we definitely did one, I think, it was the last, we did one in four, uh, for the building project as part of the SBA process. We'll, we'll work that too. We have criteria for updating school catchment uh, areas and, and happy to get input on this or a conversation or feedback on this. Um, we want to maximize enrollment in the new school building. Uh, target relief for any schools in relation to space and school in class size. Another uh, reason for updating the catchment areas is to maintain class size guidelines that the school committee uh, you know, has put forth. Um, always want to uh, do our best to avoid creating socioeconomic disproportionality in school assignments. So you know, so there is they're all they're, you can they'll never be able to in, in really almost any community without gerrymandering you know districts in a really funky way to have balance you know that. Can, you know, in any, in any sort of uh, across many indicators, okay. Specific is for socioeconomic disproportionality here. And the reason that we don't want to get that too out of whack is because there's just, you know, um, you know uh, on many levels, I would say it's not in a way that makes sense. Um, there are many more challenges for those families who are lower on the socioeconomic um, uh, levels uh, in just living life, honestly. And that includes uh, education as well. So um, higher needs, typically not always. Um, we want to make sure there's no real range of, of differences between schools. So we'll try to balance that as best we can. Um, try to, again, this goes back to Jerry Manor. You want to have, a, you want to have, try not to have this school, school catchment areas that are bizarrely shaped or extend too far. Um, we have some challenge on that because we have Plum Cove, which is in a very far part north. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. Confused in my geography, circling uh, Gloucester and water everywhere, so it throws me <laughs> off. Um, so, but anyway, um, so there's, there's also concerning walkability and transportation, you know, and, and busing that sort of thing. And how do you, you know, not having buses, you know, go over very large swaths of, 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 of you know land and travel and sort of stuff. Um, the most important, the, the, you know, so the, the top three or four are the most important ones here. These are other ones we'll consider. Another very important one is, is second from the bottom there. It's the idea of minimizing the impact of, of change of uh, change of current students or families. 
And the notion there is we don't anticipate <clears throat> telling people, you have got, you know, who are, have a third grader and fourth grade your child's going to a different school. Okay? We don't anticipate that happening. Okay? And we don't tend to make that happen. And the way we avoid that is the grandfather. Okay? So that, what that means though is over time, the, the enrollment gets to where we want it to be when we're, when we're, when we're making the adjustments. Okay? Uh, not a perfect science. Um, another thing we could consider, but but it may you know may uh, develop sort of down the road. Really, is um, many school districts use buffer zones, meaning you have a uh, a zone, you know, a catchment area that is for a specific school. Um, but where it borders another school's catchment area, you might have a buffer zone where the students who live in that buffer zone may be assigned to either school, okay. and that gives you the flexibility if you're having large enrollment or growth enrollment um, to sort of balance that necessary. So one school doesn't happen to you know, get way out of whack and be quite crowded and other ones not. You know, I, don't know, I don't think we need to develop those right now. Um, it could be something in the future because um, we're not really, you know, we have, we have good enrollment here, solid enrollment. It's, it's steady but growing a little bit, um, but we don't have you know, sort of rapid growth right now. Um, just to show you what I mean, this is on the left are, are all the catchment zones at K to five. You'll see that, see a couple of things. One, obviously green. So you see the, the colors green is West Parish. West Parish is covering a lot more territory because as we all know, there's a, a, just the, the houses, the housing is just further afield, okay? Um, as opposed to if you look at, you know, vets being a very small um, area. West Parish is also a bigger school, whereas the original, the vets, you know, zone is a smaller school. A, you know, a denser area of the city, so it's obviously smaller. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that the light yellow, which is Plum Cove, is separated by a chunk around Beeman, which is purple. Okay, and you also see you know the Beeman purple goes down, you know, deep into the downtown or, or around Centennial. You know, so uh, that and that is just the nature of having a school, uh, Plum Cove, which. Uh, it doesn't have very many people living around it, many, very, very many students at this point, okay? And obviously the density of, of the city is closer to that downtown, right? Um, and I think when this was originally created, not wanting to have uh, Beeman not in its, in its school zone. We, you know, Beeman, sorry, not having, yeah, not having school um, in a Plum Cove, you know, um, uh, cash meter. That just doesn't make sense, right? Um, kids are walking, walking past the school to get on a bus to go to the middle school. So that's why you see the way it's constructed. Um, what's likely to happen, and this is you know, pretty obvious, is we'll make some of the, on the right is, is a zoom in of the downtown area. Um, and you know, I think Centennial's here, that sort of thing, just to, just to orient people. Um, the cut bridge is right about here, okay? Um, is there'll be adjustments down here, okay? Uh, we're not there just to know where. Um, but that's likely when their adjustments are, are to happen in some way, shape, or form. And again, not to move people from one to the next. Um, we'll give folks that option. They want to, they want to go to school that's, that's close to where they are or, or is brand new. That, that's the people can, they can do that in the cash area. But that's where we make the adjustments. And what we tend to do is to bring to you in one of your August meetings sort of the first draft. And that's what you'll have to understand. And we sort of, you know, just the public being aware of it, um, get input and suggestions and guidance. And, and then uh, early in, in September, make the final decision. We want to have both the naming of the school and the catchment areas set uh, in the very big, in the beginning of October, um, so people have that you know, for the rest of the year. So. Question? Anything to add to that? Huh. Don't, don't have anything have important to say. You start. I, no, I don't. I just have a question. How are we? Uh, how are we going to communicate all of this to families? Uh, loudly, often, and respectfully. Um, um, uh, I, 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 mean, I, I don't know yet, but oh, I mean, or do you mean like the process what's happening? No, or no. After that? I mean, before your time here, yeah, the only way to find out your school if you lived downtown was to call Captain Berga, who used to run the buses. The school system was not the source, the administration was not the source of that information. So, so, so. But when it seems registered, that was the source. No, do you mean like when, when folks maybe moved in? Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so like people will say to me like, how do I find out right. no, which okay. school I'm zoned yeah. for? And I don't have an answer. Right. <laughs> so so what we'll have on our website is <laughs> very clearly listed. Yes. Um, you know, not, not only by because obviously it's a like Washington Street, a very long street, right? Yeah. And it's it's it, it sometimes broken. I mean, at some point it's broken down by address, right? right? So we'll have that sort of thing. Yeah. It'll it'll uh it, it needs to be. I've seen sort of uh, lookup databases, yeah. which are actually uh, quite con quite confusing. I mean, they're a good tool in many ways, but they're also you know confusing. And, and but um, I think a uh, pretty straightforward listing is it's probably the best way to go. Or some need to search. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be a significant. That didn't exist, especially for downtown. It doesn't it doesn't exist really for downtown, especially for those areas that are sort of cut up. The listing. What about does it? I'm sorry. What does it exist? Like, like that easily um, accessible, accessible information on your district. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, what is your assigned right. district? It's and, not. Yeah, and we'll also have a map, you know. And so, I mean, I tend to have a couple of ways people can yeah. can, can you know yeah. find out there pretty well. Right. So, and then make sure real people where to find it. Everybody can find it. <laughs> what did you say? You make sure realtors can find it. Oh yeah. Well, that's that was actually my next comment. Is that realtors will often say the wrong district. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it would be good to have that conversation. Yeah. 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 Right, we'll, we'll we'll do that once we do the update. Yeah, and make sure we're here. Uh, I I just want to say I, I met somebody at work and we were they were talking about the email and from code and how it worked with somebody. He has to drive past his friend's house where their student goes to beam in to get to his kid's school. <laughs> and, and that explains everything. I just want to thank you for like, oh, for me. Oh, yeah, right. like, well, I see how that happened. Because yeah. I couldn't understand it. Like, uh, I don't get it. Okay, but now I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and just so you know, we, we will never show this publicly, but we have you know, every student and family mapped you know, uh, on, uh, you know, across the city. We don't share that publicly, obviously, because you can identify where students live, right? And, and what grade they're in. Like, we would never share that in years. But it's a tool we're using to understand how to, uh, what the impact is of making changes. Okay. Um, and, and so you can see just, you know, the different changes, different densities of where students are coming from when you look at that. It's, yeah, just, it's just, you know, so clear. So it's, yeah. but, but again, uh, we wouldn't share that, but it's, it's, it's pretty obvious why you have that. It's a sharing. All right, bring you on. Okay. Uh, yeah, next order of business is the uh, superintendent's report. Okay. So, school safety and security update. So, I want to give folks an update. Uh, I think we gave you an update uh, in the fall so when you're doing some um, safety drills. And, that was, um, and so, I just want to go through a couple of slides and areas. Obviously, Always of importance to the families and our staff. Um, you know, uh, it's something that, that's uh, on our mind. We may not talk a lot about a lot of it, um, you know, or uh, you know, but it's always on our mind. I can guarantee that it was uh, almost always work being done. Um, so, the, the probably the first and foremost, uh, in, uh, sorry, first and most important area on safety and security is knowing our students have been as well. This is often, uh, I mean, I like to highlight it because it's really the, it's our first line right, of safety and security. And, and what I think is great about Gloucester is that um, a lot of our staff know our families and have known our families and, um, and, um, you know, and our neighbors of, their fam of, our, of our families in our schools, which is great. But uh, a piece of that is we have lots of levels of staff, uh, you know, clinical staff. So adjustment counselors, guidance counselors, psychologists, and teachers, and our paraprofessionals. Our principals, assistant principals, and other school administrators, and our school and I'll, I'll mention. So those, let's start with those. And a major part of their job is knowing our students well. What's going well for them? What's difficult for them? What they're struggling with? Okay, um, and that's important two levels. We can identify kids who might be in distress for any number of reasons. Okay, we can support them and, and work with our families. Um, but also because of those relationships that are really important to us. Um, we actively work on when kids see something they tell us almost not i would say all the time but so many times um you know a level of a concern a student might have because something they saw on social media they will tell a teacher they will tell a guidance counselor okay um something happened to a student or is happening to a student they tell us okay uh, they tell they tell a staff member they tell an adult okay? we know well who knows that who knows them well 
that's just crucial in all of this in terms of um, helping our students score students, but also knowing where risks or threats might be. Okay. Um, and that's not only school student learning about things that are happening inside our schools, that may be student telling us about you know, things that are happening outside of school with our students or with others. Okay. Um, another piece here is school resource officers. I, you've heard me talk about this quite a bit, but I, I'm just really, we work, our school resource, resource officers, so this is going to be the specific people. Officer Michael Scola and Officer Peter Tara, um, who are our primary school resource officers, work very, very well with us and our, and our kids and our families. They know them well. They've been with me for a long time. They grew up here. Um, and so they're also a resource. And kids go to them, just like they might go to a teacher or guidance counselor. They tell them, talk to them, use them as a resource. Um, so they're very valuable in, in knowing this. And then, of course, they have access to you know, any in any certain any specific situations or, or, or that, that are necessary, you know, have a whole police office, police uh, force be hard behind them. So, which um, allows me to go to the next one, which, which is our preparedness. So a big piece of our preparedness happens every every year in the summertime or annual meeting with police and fire leadership. So just last summer, we were in here with uh, um, one of the lieutenants who uh, handles emergency response. Um, with our leader team talking about drills and, and, and preparation and training. Uh, we also have, uh, so we have a, a summer meeting with myself and some of our district leaders, as well as the police and fire chief and some, some of their leaders as well. And a lot of things happen in that. We prepare, prepare for um, drills. Um, we, re we review changes of first responder protocols. So some that's happened over many years, unfortunately, um, is that uh, first responders, I mean, the field really learns from different incidents that happen, happen um, uh, around the country. And so, and they will change protocols from time to time. Um, and so part of that, those meetings are us learning what the changes are and incorporating them with, with them. Um, we also share any updates about school emergency plans with the police department they, and, and fire have those on file. So we have, you know, detailed uh, emergency plans for each school in a number of areas. Um, and then, as I said, also part of that is preparing for annual drills. So that's part of the preparedness with, the, with our emergency personnel. Um, the other place, place is regular communication with the, our, our colleagues at the police department about things that are coming up, that are bubbling up, maybe be school-based, might be something that's local, a, a risk, a threat, a concern, might be something that's happening on social media, um, you know, nationally, that sort of thing, that's a risk or a threat. Um, and so we're in regular communication on many on all those levels. And that might be uh, principal talking or teacher talking to school resource, resource officer, all the way to me talking to chief of police. And I just want to focus on those very open minds of communication. Um, and, and also um, this great support. Uh, I, it, it was, it was just, uh, just a great work relationship. And that's, that's I, 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 I want folks to know that isn't always the case. That is, that is it's notable. Um, to say that. Um, we just pause there. We're going to go into training and facilities in a moment, uh, but I want to pause there to see if folks have any questions. Uh, in terms of training, so uh, the first one's really important. Um, so we have fire drills, evacuation drills, and also drills for intruders, okay? Um, uh, those have changed over time, over the years. Uh, developmentally, developmentally appropriate is what's crucial, okay? Um, we can speak in ways and, and tell um, high school students uh, and, and different things than we tell elementary school students, okay? Which, which you do when you're teaching or when you're coaching or anything, right? That makes a lot of sense. Um, and, uh, but we're also very, very aware um, that uh, any of it uh, can really throw uh, a student or staff member, obviously. Um, and so we're very conscious of um, how what language we use have changed our, the language we've used in terms of preparing staff uh, over the years and have changed language that we use in terms of talking to kids about it as well. Um, uh, and especially at the high school, staff will typically uh, inform, will usually give folks a heads up something's coming, okay? Um, but at the high school, uh, typically there's um, instructions that are happening you know, with students in advance, that sort of thing, um, that are clear. Because the, the drills that we might do in high school are a little more complex than the drills we might do in high school, um, that sort of thing. Um, an important piece on that is that whenever we're doing drills, uh, whether that's fire, whether that's fi fire drill or an intruder drill, um, the police or fire have a team on site who are observing and watching and seeing how things go. 
then they give, give us feedback on, on how well that was done and what we can put forward. So then the last piece is facilities. Um, so as you know, but just to tell the public as well, the entry into security upgrades and a mailing GHS to match what exists in West Parish. Um, those are complete. Um, the new consolidated BTS Betts building will have similar um, safety features uh, at the entryway and around the building. Um, and then one very important piece, really a crucial piece is that ensuring all doors are working properly in the locker room, school hours. Um, one thing we really just, just recently sort of raised to a very high level is and have changed our protocols on is, is if, if, we, um, if there's a um, any non-working exterior doors for any reason, that could be electronically, that could be um, just a lock, that be, could that be just a fixture work, whatever it is, okay? Um, and any principal, um, we are here about those. As soon as they hear about it, they come at me, and this is directed to DW immediately, and we escalate that to the, to, to, to happen that day. Um, and that, that, a recent example of that was just here at the high school on Friday, and within a half an hour, you know, we had folks on site fixing it. So that's just a simple change that, that we can, you know, just, you know can do and, and are doing. Um, and then always continue to remind folks that propping doors open is just absolutely not allowed and can't be tolerated. And um, it's something that happens at schools, unfortunately. And um, it's now, uh, we're making it clear to staff that um, any doors that are propped open, the propping of doors is subject to progressive discipline for all employees. Um, that's that's a, 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 just a, a new thing we're uh, we'll put in place like right now or, or just this week. Um, after talking to our, our new partners. Um, and then part of that also then is making sure that we have good access to the doors we need to. And so some changes will happen on that, whether that's you know uh, keys to folks or whether it's key card access. So I'll give you one example here um, that we're working on right now is uh, at the athletics hallway, uh, in the athletics hallway, athletics hallway here in, um, in, the, in, the, in the high school, making that, that is key card access at the end of that. In the back of the hallway. So, so there's some change that will happen on that that we're working on, but um, just want to make sure we escalate any concerns about doors uh, you know, really quickly. Can I ask questions yeah. specific about the athletic door? I know this is like specific to when the school day is in session, mm -hmm. but that athletic door, when there are events or practices, is wide open. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if we can have just a conversation with the athletic director on how we can better manage yeah, that. Yeah. So, 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 and there are other conversations for, you know, how to use the doors at, at, at West Parish because the way they were designed or which ones to use as primary access and the way that actually it turns out it, it's best to use them in terms of primary access, you know, so there has to be some adjustments at, 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 at a door there. Okay. So, but that, those are the conversations now. Uh, we have to have in order to make sure that and the key card access at, at, at that particular door here is is one of the steps in that and then also it's talking to, to in talking to a principal athletic director you know a food service work, uh, manager um how they need to use the door and how to make sure we um uh it's locked but then we can have folks who need access to that can get access when 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 they need it basically. so i guess specifically that door is used by students coming and going from the athletic right. building in off hours. And so it's often open. Right. No, I understand that. Yeah, okay. yeah I get that. Okay. Yeah. So, because they, I'm assuming they're not going to have to no, right. and, and that's so, why talking to, to other to understand exactly how is it used yeah, and to what extent, and what, not only what extent, but like in what ways can we make it so it's secure? Yeah. You know, it has to be secure, um, but understanding the use of it, right? Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I just wanted yeah. to mention something that had happened um, a few years ago where there was a medical situation in our schools and the term that was used was sheltering in place. Yeah. And I think through that we learned that the more appropriate term is learning in place. Like, you know, keep kids in their classrooms, yeah. a medical emergency can be dealt with, you know, because because a term like sheltering in place sets up in the water. Yeah. But learning in place. Everybody, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So I think all these learning things to kind of keep anxiety down and, and be as informative as we can for families and things. So. Yes, yeah, and that's 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 a really good example of how you know protocol change, language change on this because um, we learn more and you know and, um, and 
and just that example where we place with, with that, that example of a medical emergency, that's really for two things, right? One for obviously the privacy of the individual and make sure they get the right care, but also that it, it can be very you know alarming or disturbing or, or, or just you know nerve-wracking for any child, uh, especially you know, for any any aged person to you know see a medical emergency, right? So we're thinking of both sides of it, right? Yeah, very good. All right, going to more to some more health stuff, but this is um, we have gotten two straight weeks of the my favorite data, which is uh, it's back the fecal matter waste wastewater testing results. Uh, you can see the downward trend uh, in Boston, which is great, um, and that is as it always does. Uh, it's reflected in our total case count here. Um, you can see over the past uh, just a few weeks, uh, we have nine total cases. Uh, across our across our schools, um, still keeping track of things the same way we have, you know, since um, well, I guess since um, earlier this year when uh, when we when we you know, sort of really instituted the uh, the on site I'm sorry the take home testing as well as pool testing. There's just the the blow by blow week by week since October of total cases. So you see nine were essentially at our lowest state. You know, uh, which you know was matched in early March and matched in uh, you know in, in early fall, um, but uh, as we had hoped, you know, quite low. Um, so cases popping. As everyone knows, we've been getting cases popping up and up and uh, down. Or, you know, here uh, we hear that. And then I I read in the papers for what's worth. Um, New England is going down in general, but there's still places in Massachusetts which are pretty high. But that's not the case in Boston. Um, uh, this is just as I've been showing you, sort of a the regular the testing and uh, you know obviously still consistent in how many folks were testing each week in terms of the actual number of tests um, and then you see the other positive bounds positive found positive found uh, this week so far are, are a total of five. Um, the last piece is just as to check in with me but any questions about COVID and the case count okay all good news yes hurrah, hurrah. Hurrah. Yeah. Um, last piece is the student evaluation process, uh, just to check in because it says here, June 8th, uh, check in on progress, discuss process, any questions about that to, for, for, you, uh, for you folks to discuss. Um, and then uh, you have a deadline as well, but uh, that's, that's your deadline, not mine. Um, but any, just want to, as we said, give you the opportunity to check in and see how things go. Yeah, and I did have a, um, a question of clarification of the forms and um, on page three of the form it seemed you know it has kind of blank lines as to goals and we need to fill that will be filled in on the template so that they'll reflect the superintendent's goals line by line so that um, it's clear on the evaluation form where we will put that information so we'll get a new template yeah we'll update the template that's on in the drive okay okay you just go to the drive so uh uh, Kathy, uh, Stephanie, I will just update that tomorrow morning, and it, it's it's essentially the same except for that that that's oh, that one that's page, it. right? Yeah, right. Yeah. But the is the I've been accessing that from your email. Yeah, me too. That form, not Ben's whole drive of right evidence, but is where where on the drive would that be? It's in the same folder. Those, so I, I can show it to you. Sure. that you sent um and what i usually do, what i've always done is download the form so i'm working on my own version of the form right so i would then just you know take the new form and download that form to work locally on my computer so I to do things. <laughs> um and if there's an update like that then i would either figure out if i want to copy and paste the information into my form or take the new Start looking at so, 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 into the new form. <clears throat> I'm, I'm seeing where you are, Ben. Yeah, so, so, uh, shoot, uh, let me see if I can zoom in here. So, just so you see, this is the folder you have access mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Um, there's the evidence folder in that, there's the goals and the evidence, which is, which is just that uh, the sheet I gave you, um, with the link to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that's just a copy of my goals, the, the original document. Um, this is the rubric, and then this is the oh. some of the evaluation form, which you can download as a as a Word document and fill in as needed. Um, uh, I'm a little 
concern that so what you emailed earlier on, did you, did you re email this one? Because remember, the, the, there's this. You said, you, you said that it was the rubrics that which was updated, not. Oh, you're right. That's not the form. That the, form right. the form is always been updated. So the form that, that uh, Kathy emailed you earlier on is, is the same form. Okay. That, that is also right. So if you're using that from the email, you're, you're right on time. Wait, can you? Oh, but okay, got it. But, and but you haven't changed it yet. No, right. And, and, and what we were going to, we're just going to essentially copy and paste yes. Goals. Yes. my goal, the goals that you, you know, that we agreed upon into yes. this page, right? Here. Right. Okay. okay. That's all. That, that's the only change you're going to see. Yeah. Right. Um, right. You also might just, uh, so, so that's clear, right? In terms of yeah. just this one page will change. Nothing else is going to change. Um, what I will do, I did for last year was um, I actually specifically uh pointed out to some of the indicators as focus indicators okay all right i didn't do that this year well, i'll just show you what i did so i'm not just speaking you know, what i i think you can see this on your screen and i just gave you the standards that were that were connected to these goals i see okay so the standard is a high you know is, is, a, is, is these you know broader categories mm -hmm. and so tomorrow morning um and that just that just um you know um, it helps you connect the dots in terms of the specifics of any of these indicators that I think is really connected to um, you know, the work I work with you doing. Um, it's not essential. I think it's going to be helpful to you to some degree. Um, that's all. So, just can I ask a question? So, on the page you're on right now, yeah. I'm just looking at this focus indicator check it, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll check those in some way. So that's going to be on the new document. Yeah, it'll it'll, it'll be it'll it'll be this. You'll you'll just. But it'll be this document with that too. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I just fantastic. gotta figure out how to check those these these things. Yeah, I was supposed to do that by erasing that. And then, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, suggest. this form is really it's awesome. Isn't it? <laughs> 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 no, I'm sorry, that. my head exploded when I saw it. I was <laughs> like, somebody would have made it. Right, right, because. Because these are checkboxes, right? They're supposed to be. And you can you can delete them and just put your own X. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I think I just oh, no, I highlighted that last year. Yeah. Well, I highlighted all the works. Anyway, on the Mac, Mac is really challenging. Use this. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, what well, I I'm 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 saying that is you don't have to do it. <laughs> okay. And then along that same uh, along this topic, um, we need to negotiate with the superintendent for this next contract by the end of the school year. Um, so I would like to suggest that there's a personnel meeting on Monday, June 26, where we discuss that. And then um, a full school committee meeting on the 28th will be a one item agenda. So the Monday in June is the 27th. Yep. I'm oh, sorry. Um, and I'm unavailable, so I am too. You're unavailable? Yeah, 27th and 29th. So if Maria's not available and far as I know, so we can work through that. Okay. Not 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 on camera. <laughs> no, no, struggle. Okay. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> um Yeah. Um, oh wait, what time would it be? The person I mean. I have to be in Danvers by okay. seven fifteen. So I'd have to leave here by quarter seven. I think you'd be okay. Five o'clock. Yeah. yeah. Additional meeting you said um, it was the twenty eighth? Twenty ninth, so yeah. No. I don't know why I'm right now. The twenty eighth. Right. Twenty ninth at six. Um, I said my anniversary was the twenty ninth. Could be on twenty eighth. <laughs> I said my anniversary was the twenty ninth. Could be on twenty eighth. I said my anniversary oh, was the twenty ninth. Could be on twenty eighth. Dream twelve instead of your anniversary. <laughs> 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 Did she confirm that collaboration? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant. Uh, anyway, to, I'm but, hesitant to give Trina any of your um, contact information, just for the record. Okay. Okay. So, anyway, <laughs> we can figure out. But we, we do need to have a meeting that week, so we can. Yeah. Um, 
hired that out to make okay. sure everybody's available. Oh, and Melissa would like to say something. No, it's just a suggestion that we do it as a school committee as a whole an executive session at our last Wednesday of the month meeting because we're all going to weigh in on it anyway. On the 22nd? No, I think, don't we have a meeting the last Wednesday of the month as well? No. No. It's the 27th. I thought we did. I thought we were doing something that week. So if you have a personnel meeting, when is the school committee approving it? In August? No, the following, two days later. So, so, so that would be the last Wednesday. So we're trying to figure out if, if to, to have a meeting on the last Wednesday. What isn't scheduled yeah. now? Does that make sense? I thought the personnel meeting was the last Monday of the month. <clears throat> that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, yes, that's what we're trying. If you have it that Monday, the school committee isn't going to get it until when? We're not meeting in July, so it wouldn't be approved until August. I'm mm -hmm. suggesting we meet, we schedule the Monday and the Wednesday or Monday, Tuesday. Okay, so that's what I thought. So I'm suggesting that you don't have just a personnel meeting and have the full school committee meeting on the Wednesday and we can do it in executive session because everyone weighs in on the superintendent's contract. So one meeting. Yeah, one meeting. Okay. Is that okay? Well, I'm hearing that there's struggles for the Monday attendance and with Maria right. and Laura. So since we're all going to have a say in this, it just would make sense to do it that Wednesday as a group. Well, Wednesday or Tuesday. Tuesday. Or Tuesday if people are okay on a Tuesday. Sure. I'm not, but I'm not telling anything. So you guys can. You're right. Yeah. Why not Wednesday? Why are we doing Tuesday? No, but Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday can 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 be can be really? can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know. Find, there, How about Thursday? But wait, if we're in executive session, then not would be part of it or not part of it? I think part of it somewhere. Right, but not the initial, right? Right. Yeah. Well, we'll, 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 we'll figure that out. Yeah. But just everyone has a heads up that, that that's what you're trying to accomplish, and then we'll see the details shortly, you know, as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. And it's right. So. Okay. Thank you for your superintendent's report. Yeah. Okay. Um, there have been no subcommittee meetings since our last school committee meeting, so there are no reports. Um, under action, we have approval of policies, which is the second reading of the revised attendance uh, policy file JE. And I know the superintendent and assistant superintendent have done a lot of work to kind of reorganize and um, make it in the, in the format we were. You want us to present what change? I would probably have I would Greg summarize just the change that have been made, which are more in format than substance. In fact, they are all in format rather than substance. Yeah. You are. Yeah, they're well, not entirely. There's some there's some content that is new. Um, sorry, one second. Do you need to share? Uh, I'm not sure if I need to share, but I, I, everybody has copies. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first thing that I did was to pull out all of the things that are related to um, uh, to Mass General Law and are required. And those are all now in policy JE. And those include uh, a very brief introduction, but then uh, under the heading student, uh, state laws governing student attendance, that's where we see uh, parent guardian responsibilities, uh, school notification requirements, and then a new, sorry, uh, new content. Um, I, I noted in some policies, but not in others across the district, um, absence of students due to religious beliefs. Um, I put that in, ran it by our attorney, and said it was absolutely appropriate to be in there. Uh, uh, habitually truant and CRA and dropping out of school, the legal references are all at the bottom. And that constitutes the three page policy JE that is strictly about all the relevant uh, tenants laws. And, and just the JEE -E is like the JEE -E is 
what initially uh, I was, was thinking of would be an exhibit, but it still goes in the manual as a, uh, um, in the policy manual, but we can think of it as the exhibit that is the guide for um, creating the entries in the handbooks, which you will you approve annually. So you have a chance to take a look at it, the product of the results of the attendance teams as they put the operational procedures and protocols together. So you'll see that file JE-E -E is the guidance for creating operational procedures and protocols for inclusion in student and parent handbooks. And this includes the relevant information from the original policy that creates the case for and the guiding principles and the goals and some of the requirements to guide those teams. So they will refer to these when creating their, um, their uh, protocols and procedures for their handbooks, which you will then have an opportunity to approve as part of the handbook approval. This year that will happen separately because they will be creating that piece. But in, this, in the future, in the spring, you'll see the part of the handbook. So this guide includes terminology, um, guidance, um, the multi-tiered system of supports information that is not necessarily something you need in your, your primary tenants policy relative, relevant to the laws. And then you'll note that I added on the, the very end, um, the uh, two paragraphs, operational procedure and protocol, gu protocol guide should be completed for school committee approval and inclusion in student parent handbooks. This year, we're shooting for the, the August 12th meeting. That'll be the last one that will allow them to include it in, in the digital handbooks. And then in the subsequent years, it will be part of the regular annual approval. And uh, final line is that the operational pr procedure and protocol guides should be designed at the school level to comply with the Foster School Committee Attendance Policy JE. So they should make sure that when using these principles, uh, practices, uh, and goals, that they are also making sure that it complies with the file JE. So that's we decided to approach this challenge where there's a lot of procedural um, protocol information that should go in the handbooks, but we want to memorialize that and make sure that that, that is followed when they create them. Thank you for that. So, so JE, the, th the laws, yep. Will become once we have our policy. That will become the policy. Like once those policies are written by the attendance teams, the procedures, the procedures, procedures, right? right. That's the procedure. Yeah. Right. So that those procedures will be part of JE. Um, JE on July first will be the school committee's policy around attendance, and that covers. That covers legally covers us, and, and we're in compliance with the laws. And we have to have that policy at the school district level in the school committee handbook, so uh, um, policy manual. So JE becomes policy effective July first, regardless of anything else that happens. Okay. That policy is there. And, then, and just a, just a, so and, and the policy as, as everyone knows lays out the framework for the. Procedures and work, right? And I want to point out the two, you know, just two, you know, very important pieces in, in, in the policy in JE. Okay, one, the, all the state laws. Okay, obviously, but the other piece is on the first page, underneath the numbered list, one through four. Okay, I mean, introduction, yes, but particularly the paragraph right after the bulleted list that begins the Los Angeles School Tenant Policy and Operate for you to establish a tier system of support. Mm -hmm. That's the basis of all the okay. of, the, of the shift in approach. That we're doing not in the shift in the, in the approach in the original version the first year was all laid out very specifically mm -hmm. here you see the specifics in, in jee the procedures right. like the framework for it as, as in the policy is that paragraph really okay. what's important for that is that 
um, the school committee then saying, this is the direction we want it to be done. And right. in, in, that, in that introduction. And the procedures, specific procedures that come out of the attendance teams. You will vote on, because those are put in the handbook. And those go in the handbook. And, don't. and you vote on them in that way. Okay. Got yep. it. Thank and, you. And they have been there for, for years. That's where they end up. And we've also had, um, you know, they, they're sort of the, the, the foundational policy has always been in the school committee policy uh, manual as well. So we're, we're continuing that pattern, but with JDE that provides right. more clear guidance when you're developing your annual um, policy, your procedures and protocols in your annual. So with that description, we have the policy. Let's discuss the policy first. Oh, Melissa. Thank you. So I just have a question. Um, so the exit, the JEE, will that go away once the policy and procedures are in place? Will that incorporate the language necessary into the, the, policy, the policy and procedures? Not the policy, the procedures. In other words, we're not going to have JE, JEE, -E and the procedures, correct? We should just have the policy and then the procedures. Once um, my my uh, in, the intention that I have here is that we have here is that the J J E and JEE -E will stay in the school committee policy manual. And the actual procedures that are, and they, they need to stay there so that. Each year, if a, as a school revisits their actual nuts and bolts policies, this will happen so many days. Uh, these are the kinds of things that parents need to do, that those could always have a reference until it's changed at the committee, school committee level, uh, both in the JE and JEE. -E. So those will both remain at the district policy manual level. And then the operational procedures and protocols have yet to be developed. And those may be subject to um, modification within the parameters that are outlined here in these actual uh, the JE and JEE, -E, that those will continue to guide the development of the, the detail level that happen, that's gonna appear in the handbooks. So Greg, let me ask you this. Um, great this is great work. I, I'm just trying to follow process here. So when you read policy manuals in all, in all school districts, they're set up the same. You know, they all have the same policy lettering. Um, do, uh, do we have other policies that have an exhibit, as you say, in our manual? Because that doesn't, doesn't seem the norm in all the policy manuals I've read, because I've read a lot of different school manuals for different reasons in the past. And I've never seen exhibits in a policy manual. So I'm just trying to make sure that we're consistent with the rules that are set out as you develop a policy manual. I understand the importance of the language and why what the intent is. And that's why I asked my question was, when we do get to the procedures, because those are common to be in policy manuals, will the EE be incorporated into the procedures so that so that it captures the intention and the procedures? Or are we doing something different in our policy manual that other schools don't? When you're That's what I'm trying to get at. When you're saying will JEE -E appear in the procedures, are you, are you saying will that appear in the handbooks? Because that's where the procedures are going to appear. No, so the so we have a policy manual that's online. Yep. And that's where policies and procedures are as well. You know, that's that that's our policy and procedure manual. I'm not too concerned about the handbooks because that's a reference for students, but we have a policy manual that's on file. And it's set up similar as other school districts that the A's, the B's, the C's, they're all the same in all the school districts. And what I'm saying is in other manuals, because I've read many, they have the policy and then they give the procedures to that policy on some occasions. So I'm not talking about handbooks right now, I'm talking about our policy manual. 
So will the JE-E turn into the policy, the, I'm sorry, I keep saying policy, the procedures to the policy JE? I, once it, once it's I'm, developed. A little bit, uh, I'm a little confused because the directive at the last meeting, as I understood it, was that the policy was incorporating both policy and procedures and that those needed to be uh, those needed to be separated or removed. So the work was done to, to do that and separate it in what I felt was the most logical way of sort of separating law and procedure. I see no reason why JE and JE-E can't coexist in a policy manual. It's not, it's not written as a, it doesn't say exhibit, it doesn't, it's, it's a, it's a, it in, incorporates things that could can, could be contained in a in a single policy. We do have policies in our own handbook that mix policy and protocols and procedures. We have a number of those. So uh, this uh, seemed to be an approach that would sort of logically separate uh, some of those procedural kinds of things from the the, the, the laws themselves. Yeah, so let me do this, this Fred, because this is excellent work. I'm not saying what you did is different than what I expected. This is what I expected. Um, so I see that JE is our policy that that is the policy. And you labeled the um, the backup to it as JE-E. So that's what's throwing me off. I understand it's separate, but what I'm asking is, will that the second part of it become the language in the procedures? Oh, or so another question to ask is, do we have this type of supporting document with any other of our policies? Because I've never for, we definitely have it for building use. We have our building use policy and our building use procedures. Right, and that's how we have it with our bullying policy as well, right? That that's very common. But this is this JE E isn't procedures yet because right, we haven't right. been developed, and I'm assuming that it's going to turn into the yeah. procedures once the work is done. So I so I think I think there's a there's a both and here. I think Melissa, I think you're right on that. The JE isn't uh, our typical procedures document. It's something something a little bit different, right? Sort of in between, right? No. Right, we're not there um, yet. right, so so um, and, that, and that's why there's a little confusion here, I believe, right? Because it's a little bit in between. No big deal. Um, yeah. but, I, but I do think that when we have the procedure, so as, as you've heard Greg say, the next step on this, once you get approval on this, the next step is to actually develop the operating procedures, right? Mm -hmm. We can incorporate that into the policy manual, um, just like you know, if we need to or we want to, if you want to, the school committee, and we'll also have that in the, in the handbooks as well, which you also vote on. So so I think I think it's important to have, and I think you know, Greg, tell me if you agree on this one, to have JE as it is in the policy manual. It really sets out, you know, it's sort of like, you know, just model on this, because attendance is like really complicated in many levels, it sort of sets out the all parts of it, you know. So that that's and I don't know if that's okay with you are um well it's not like folks just to hear, but that's what I'm saying is like we have you know all of it ultimately into the uh, policy manual. Um, and uh, and then also the procedures that are still to be developed in there as well as in the, in the books. Is that a way to go forward? Yeah, yeah and if these if the procedures get more firmed up as they firmed up, this may get revoted to be to reflect what, what's decided. Yeah, you could revoke that, right? You also vote during the, with the handbooks as well. Right. Yeah, there, there are some options there. Yeah. But this week tonight we're approving the framework. And the guidance that yeah. and if, lays you want out to, that. if you want to incorporate what the attendance teams do and you decide that that shouldn't that should be more than just in the handbooks that, yeah. that's fine okay okay so um so let's just take up the policy does anybody have any questions comments on the policy because it is the language we had in our um previous School committee meeting and it's a different format. <clears throat> Melissa? I just have one suggestion and it's not changing the language, it's just changing the order of paragraphs, which is on the last page in page three under um, the habitually truant students and CRA. When I read this, it just it makes sense to do the 
the first paragraph stay the same and then that third paragraph become the second paragraph because you're introducing what a CRA is and then the language um, to follow that talks about whether the school district will file one or not. But other than that, I thought, I think it's excellent work. Okay. Have a objection? Okay. Okay. Um, I just have one thing on the previous page at the top, parent guardian responsibilities. Um, calling the school at a designated number at a designated time. Should it be and designated time? That's a semantic thing. But the other thing is it says, as established by the school committee to report a child's absence and reason for it. We school committee did not really dictate the time that the schools themselves want those notifications. Right. So, to, so, then, so I would end it or at, you know, designated time as established by, I would say the superintendent. Because you would then direct yeah, right. your- direct the principals to determine that and have that be in the handbook. So yeah, it's an sure. operational. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just say, so, so uh, calling school at designated time uh, and, and designated um, number and time and designated time as such by the school. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you want you want to say to report a child's absence and reason for it. You want to keep yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Do we have a motion to approve the second reading? So moved. Second. As amended. As amended. So moved. Yeah. Do we need to read another reading of it? This was our second. So I think we do two, right? No, I think like because, because, it's, because it's an amended policy. because it's an amended policy, we don't do two full readings, right. right, Melissa? We can um we can do a motion to waive the reading. Okay. So we want to do that first before we take the other. And we can we waive the reading. Second. Um, Maria, roll call vote. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Mason? Yes. Jefferson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. Mr. Minio? Yes. And Ms. Prince? Yes. Um, back to the other motion that was moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, I'll call vote, please. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Mason? Yes. Jefferson Clancy? Yes. Mr. Melvin? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Minio? Yes. And Ms. Prince? Yes. Okay. Um, so now we have um, the attendance policy procedures, JB-E. -E. Does anyone have um, questions or changes? Okay. Um, I see none. I have one question. Um, well, common, I guess. Underneath attendance failure policy, the second paragraph, it says the current attendance policy, failure policy at Gloucester High School will be eliminated. Um, I think we should say is eliminated. Because once we adopted it, I don't know, you tell me. This oh. is guidance, right? So when will it be, or it should say will be eliminated effective block? Yeah, it's, it's, it's will be because it, it goes into, I think we had discussed by the end of the first term. Right, so we'll be effective, what, during fall 2000? Yeah, uh, so but we'll, we'll be limited by second term of the 2022-20 of the school year. Yeah, I think that's what we had in originally. I'm not sure Do you, where that okay. went, but um, yeah, that's the intention. It, do, we, do we hamstring ourselves by putting a time on it. I just, in the interest of. You also create a deadline. Right. So it's, I, I think also this is important for parents too. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's both, right? So then if it doesn't happen, yeah. well, you could create, create a, deadline. a different deadline. Or do you um, want to say before? According to the principal, that's uh, a deadline that they. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so the amendment is just will be eliminated um, by in the first term of the 2022 2023 fiscal year, but in the first term. I'm using the right language here. It's not much of a Two twenty twenty first Okay. Well, okay. We use the language end of the first quarter of the twenty two twenty two okay. year. We said end of the first term. End of the first right. term of the 2022-2023. Right, but what I'm saying is in that exact same paragraph, we have something else that says end of the first quarter of the 2022 school year. So let's just be consistent. So but that, that's a that's a different piece because I think if I'm reading this properly, it's okay. But, but, it's a different piece, but uh, is it all at the same time? No, 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 actually, Greg, you're going this. And the second part, which is creating the operational committee to develop trauma informed engagement protocols, that that uh, the committee is developed by the first quarter, right? Those two separate things. Um, it's quarter and one moment. Different. Um, uh, tenants failure policy uh, page page uh, oh, uh, under section C tenants yeah, failure yeah, policy yeah. paragraph one uh, paragraph two current yeah. tenants tip failure poly policy will be eliminated shall form uh, Gloucester High School shall form a policy operational committee to develop trauma informed engagement protocols to improve attendance and chronic absence for implementation. By the end of the first quarter of the 2023 school year for inclusion. Um, you, um, that is, it, it is, it is two things that are combined there. Right. Uh, that the they policy is going, the committee will meet this summer and they are going to develop, there, there are multiple things happening. Uh, that that may involve, you know, uh, all of the protocols and procedures we were talking about. Um, those would be implemented by the end of the first quarter because if something is approved, um, you know, August twelfth for handbooks, the likelihood of being able to put that immediately into action for the first day of school, I wanted to leave enough time. To do that, so those changes to be ready by the end of the quarter to take effect by the quarter include the the um, attendance failure policy. So, so it's the same it's, time. it's it's all it's okay, the attendance failure policy yeah. and right. the operational protocols and procedures will be implemented. They're going to plan this summer. Right. So it's that same language. So it's time. it's contained in that. Yeah, but what she's saying is we said end of the first term. This says end of the first quarter. So, I, just want, I just think it should. Yeah, be semester same. is is two terms. Quarter and semester and term are same. Yeah. Yeah. So we should use one or the other. Okay. Oh, for that's oh yeah. that's sorry. This is one of the, I shouldn't have that. Do we use term elsewhere? Because I no no. Uh, so you're saying term and quarter synonymous. Yeah. So let's use quarter. Well, quarters are already in there. What we would be doing then is, though they're contained in the same paragraph, uh, it's not. It, we can say it twice. You you could make it more explicit. It's contained in the directive to 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 change right. by that. Essentially, what we did was we we it was already in there uh, for the timeline for the uh, the for the attendance fault fairly policy because it, it, it right. you think the whole, whole paragraph is one. Yeah. Okay. So leave it the way so we just leave it the way. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I think it's I, so I think it's already, contained as it is. Already embedded in there. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. So um do we have a motion to approve file J E dash P e wave the first reading. I mean, wave the actual reading. Oh, well, this is uh, this is procedures. 
Yeah, we should waive the reading because this was part of what we waived for the first time when we then separated it. I move we waive the reading policy J. Second. Melissa? I just want to clarify, are we calling this a policy? Recall, I think it should say attendance procedure. Instead okay. of policy. Yes. Thank you. Sure. So the top gets changed to procedure. That's what? To be clear. Or attendance policy procedure. Do you need to give another motion? No. Okay. We may vote. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minio. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Yes. Excellent work, everybody that was involved. So we just wait. Right. So I move that we accept attendance procedure. No, we accept this too. Approve. 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 Right. So I move that we approve attendance procedure J. Discussion. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wiesen. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Vinio. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Yes. Excellent work all around. Yeah. For a long time, I know it's been uh, <laughs> a lot of very thoughtful work. So thank there was Greg. no amendments to Amy. Thank you, no, no, thank no, you Greg. Thank you, Amy Cam. She's Cam, still, definitely. She's she, she is, I believe she's listening. Thank, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you Amy. Okay. Um, and James Cook. And James a Cook. Time as well. And Jane, yeah, I'm sure. We get it. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have um, a request for an out of state field trip that just popped up that Greg is going to explain. And I would um, hope we would agree to. <laughs> Um, discuss and approve if we are comfortable approving this because timing is of the essence and just receive it. Okay, and it's in your email <laughs> as of six tonight. So, you want to explain? Sure. This is um, came in very recently because the logistics. Uh, I, I don't need to go into too much detail, but the, um, uh, our uh, biology teacher, Eric Lee, was extremely persistent in um, making this happen. And that involved um, working with the organization that worked with the schools and our students uh, for two and a half weeks. I uh, got a grant from the Department of Defense to, to do a, if there's a, a a description in very small type uh, down at the bottom of the first uh, first page. Uh, students completed a two and a half week advanced study in regenerative cell culture, and were um, were the winning group from all the biology classes. They presented in front of industry experts from the Gloucester Genomics Institute and Army, which is the acronym for the organization that received the grant from DoD, and they were selected as winners. So um, a, this program that worked with all of our students to explore uh, regenerative cell culture, I'll give an example of it very briefly. Uh, students were, um, had to, learned a lot about the, um, the technology and then had to um, dream up and design their own product that would use uh, uh, this kind of cell culture. <laughs> For example, to grow your own, I'm sharing this because it was really cool stuff that was happening at the high school recently, to uh, grow tissue in an artificial, um, you know, in a, in a cultured, cultured tissue that could be used for skin grafting, for example. That's one of the technologies. So students learned all about the uh, connection between the science and industry and bringing a product to market and that whole cycle. And um, they then had to do a pitch in front of industry experts. So groups of students dreamed up their product, researched it, researched the viability, uh, did some marketing around it, and then presented it. The winners here at the school were promised a trip to go to Manchester, New Hampshire, 
to go to the life science labs at the University of New Hampshire, and also the, um, the uh, it's called the, the Army, that's where they, they work in conjunction with them. This, uh, the trend, it's only for five students, uh, two teachers, and uh, the Department of Defense grant is providing the, they're providing the, the funding for the transportation to go there. It just came in, it would be, in my opinion, a real shame to disappoint the students who have worked really hard and it's just, they just completed this project. So it's, it's hot off the presses. Questions? Seeing none, sounds like an awesome opportunity. Great, I'll let them know. Thank you. Okay, Absolutely. so we shall vote, please. We need a motion. Oh, we need to make a motion to. A motion to approve the field trip uh, this particular group to a uh, facility in Manchester, New Hampshire. Second. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wiesen. Yes. Chairperson Clancy. Yes. Mr. Melvin. Yes. Ms. Minio. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Yes. Great. Sounds great. Okay. Um, so we move on to other business discussion. Um, East Coast of Veterans Memorial School Building Committee meeting, uh, committee update. There, I can think of. We have a meeting tomorrow at five regular monthly building committee meeting. Um, the project manager has been sending out notices when there's been extended work, just like they've been doing. So um, I think there's another one coming up like next week, next Monday, yeah. maybe. The, and these are the concrete pours for the concrete for our level, like the, the, all the second floor. You know, um, and and, and the, the, this is the, will be the fifth floor. They all always have to make sort of a hall in the night. Uh, advanced warning, and there hasn't been any concerns voiced uh, to the project team about the plan. I have another building thing to just to give you an update on. Happy to which is good news. Um, it's other business. Go ahead. Uh, so I learned today that. Um, the modules at Beeman will also be uh, uh, furnished this, this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, I was sort of touch and go on it. Really thought it wasn't going to happen. Um, and what's a part of that? Uh, you mean Pumpco? What did I say? You said Beeman. Sorry, Beeman and Pumpco will both be done. Yeah, That's yeah. great. Okay. So we, we thought we thought for a while just with Beeman. Um, and so B and F, I'll give them more of an update on just all the. We have like quite nicely laid out detailing what will be happening. We did visits. We mean uh, the project managers, um, Paul Russo, the custodial supervisor, and then each you know, head custodian in each building, plus um, plus myself, did walk through some of the classrooms uh, to understand exactly um, what needs to be packed up and moved away from the walls. That sort of thing. So we give so we even give them the teachers' instructions before they go. Um, the good news for for everyone is that rooms not have to be packed up and, and totally moved out. Just to voice from some exterior walls that work. Um, but I'll give I'll give you just a full update in my next week's report about the details of what's happening in each school. So it's going to make um, it's quite a better experience. Uh, weeks make sure that the envelope is <laughs> on the envelope and not sit. Will that update when you get it include the playground updates? Yeah, yep. we're making progress as well. Um, um, our next, so um, I just want to put it out there that we're thinking of the possibility of having our August first August meeting on August third instead of the tenth because the superintendent may be away. Um, on that for that meeting, so we can talk about that next time. So just have it in your head that then it will have been a break from the you know, month of July. Um, so we will move that meeting up just one week, and then we have a few weeks in between. Um, so we can talk about that. It's not set in stone, but what do we have there? All right, I think we're 
done if anybody wants to. I move that we adjourn. Second. Second. Yes. 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 Mr. Melvin. Yes. Mr. Minio. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Yes. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.